Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's Pinellas County Commission meeting. It's uh, one it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we are meeting in the Clearwater Courthouse. And without further ado, I would like to ask uh, the clerk to do the roll call. So we're all here, so that's good. And invite Monsignor Robert Morris from St. Catherine, Siena of, uh, of Clearwater to come forward and do our invocation. And the Pledge of Allegiance will be shared by Commissioner Latvala. Thank you for being here. Let us pray. Lord, as we call upon your presence and seek your counsel this afternoon, we ask that your spirit come upon us, especially our county commissioners and the residents they serve. Support us in making decisions that are pleasing to you, O God, and help us to know your will, to make it our own, and to live it in our lives. Our community faces many challenges and opportunities. Do not let ignorance or partiality influence our decisions and actions. Rather, guide our efforts to serve the common good of our citizens and help us to recognize the needs of those that are seeking safety, affordable housing, shelter, employment, and health care. As we highlight human trafficking prevention this month, support us in our efforts to keep our residents safe, especially our children and vulnerable adults. Help us to bring an end to crime and gun violence and give us the wisdom to protect the environment we have been entrusted with. May our elected officials, first responders, safety and emergency services, healthcare professionals, educators, and all who serve to build up our community experience your blessings and our gratitude for the services they provide. Blessed are you, Lord, who have brought us together this day to work toward harmony and peace and enlighten us with your grace and wisdom. For you are God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thank you, Monsignor. And now we are going to move to the presentation and awards, and we have our Human Trafficking a Prevention Month proclamation, and if Major Nathalie Pete Patterson of the Tampa Bay Human Trafficking Task Force Coordinator from the St. Petersburg Police Department, Misty LaPierre, the Task Force NGO Supervisor, Sailor Freedom, and Doug Templeton, Chief Investigator of Pinellas County Consumer, Consumer Protection. If you would come forward to the dais, please. You okay with those steps? Yeah, I see I'm just going to turn it Oh, you have the microphone. Right oh, open your eyes and you can see. All right. Um, I would like, okay, so we did that part. Oh, sorry. It is far too easy to believe slavery to be an incident of bygone errors instead of today's reality for millions of people across the world. The United Nations Global Report on Trafficking of Persons for 2020 reports that more traffickers are being brought to justice every year. Globally, the number of people convicted per 100,000 population has nearly tripled since 2003. 
Consequently, many victims of human trafficking are trafficked for the purpose of being forced into unspeakable acts of sexual abuse. Florida consistently ranks as one of the top states to receive calls and tips through the National Human Trafficking Hotline, and victims of human trafficking in Florida are trafficked from all corners of the world, including China, Thailand, Vietnam, Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, and Micronesia. In March of 2016, the Pinellas Board of County Commissioners enacted its own anti-human trafficking ordinance to help combat this malignant evil. Pinellas County Consumer, Consumer Protection continues to inspect adult use establishments, massage establishments, and specialty salons performing nail services under the ordinance to ensure they comply with the ordinance's notice and posting requirements to provide information and hope to those who may be victims of human trafficking. In 2019, the state of Florida enacted Chapter 219 through 152, an act relating to human trafficking to likewise address the evil of human trafficking throughout the state of Florida. In 2019, the state of Florida enacted Chapter 219 through 152, an act relating to human trafficking to address the evil of human trafficking throughout the state of Florida. In 2020, human, Pinellas County Human Services became a member of the newly formed Regional Tampa Bay Human Trafficking Task Force, which focuses on education, rescue, and enforcement. From January 2020 to June 2022, Tampa Bay Human Trafficking Task Force member agencies opened 354 new investigations, reported 194 arrests for human trafficking related offenses, and charged 45 individuals for human trafficking offenses. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that January 2023 be recognized as Human Trafficking Awareness Month. We encourage all Pinellas County residents to join us in the fight against human trafficking by reporting concerns to the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office or other law enforcement or the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888. And I'm very glad that you're all here this afternoon. Would you like to say something? Sure. Thank okay. you. First off, I just wanted to say thank you to each of you for hosting us and bringing us in today and for the proclamation. I thought it would be important for the audience to just share a little bit of the work that's been done since the Human Trafficking um, Task Force was started in 2019. So... I just wanted to share that so far at Sela Freedom in the last six months, we have served a total of 163 survivors of human trafficking. We've provided over 10,000 services to those survivors, trained over 694 professionals, and responded to over 355 hotline calls. In addition to that, I wanted to share some other great work that's being done in the community. Since um, July of 2022 through December 31st, Sayla Freedom and various members of law enforcement conducted over 10 human trafficking operations targeting those that are selling other people and also recovering victims. Um, training, we've provided several large-scale trainings included at the Florida Gang Investigators Conference and at various hospitals. Um, I want to share with you a couple of the trials and outcomes. So, like, what are we doing to hold people accountable? On, uh, excuse me, on September 1st, 2022, a defendant here in Pinellas County was charged with human trafficking. He was sentenced to 20 years, um, and a lot of that was providing resources for his victim to be strong enough to actually stand in trial and testify against him, getting her various medical needs met, getting dental needs met, therapy needs met, addiction services, all of those things to help a survivor be strong enough to actually stand up against the evil that was committed against her. On September 22nd, in federal court, there was a defendant who was charged um, with drug trafficking, causing overdoses, 
and disposing of a body. Um, he was actually charged in federal court and received 25 years. Even though human trafficking charges were not brought, we served two of his victims who indeed were human trafficking survivors. On October 5th, 2022, during an operation, we recovered a 17-year-old minor that had been brought through five different states before ending up in our jurisdiction. Um, again, working in collaboration with the task force. And let me tell you, these people were amazing. And Major Patterson and her support that we were able to have another survivor who had testified as a juvenile, a member from Sayla Freedom and a member from Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office fly to the um, minor's home state to meet with her in preparation for that trial and give her support. Um, the offender was sentenced to 21 years and 10 months. His charges included trafficking a minor, enticement of a minor to engage in sexual activity, use of a facility of interstate commerce and in aid of racketeering and interstate transportation of a person for prostitution. As part of his sentence, the court also ordered him to pay $27,740 to the victim and to forfeit any electronic devices used in the commission of the offense and to register as a sex offender. Um, so we are at the task force holding a lot of these offenders called, or holding them responsible. Um, and then the last two that I'll speak of, October 24, 2022, two defendants were charged in Hillsborough County for trafficking of three victims. Um, one of them was sentenced to six years, followed by a 20-year suspended sentence. The other um, offender, I believe, received a 30-year sentence. And then on, 11, on November 3rd, 2022, so just recently, we went to a sentencing in a federal case. Um, the trafficker was known to have 22 victims. Eight of them were actually charged in court, and he was just sentenced to 35 years in prison um, for his crimes, and also restitution will be ordered in this case. So these are all, this is a lot of the work that we're doing, so we appreciate all of your support and standing behind us. Major, would you like to say? You guys, I'll be brief. I wanted to say thank you for having us here and thank you for rec recognizing Human Trafficking Month. Human trafficking occurs every day, and I just wanted to also say that in recognizing human trafficking, it is also important to res recognize domestic violence because they kind of go hand in hand, and those victims are victims of human trafficking. Lastly, the task force, we have 26 law enforcement agencies that are a part of the task force. That's local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies, as well as 20 service providers to include NGOs, uh, victim advocates, and Sale of Freedom uh, non-governmental organizations like Sale of Freedom. So it's important to realize that we do have agencies that are working collaboratively as a multi-jurisdictional agency, and we're working together to fight human trafficking. And lastly, if anyone encounters or want to know how to make reports, you can report to the players, the hotline, or you can pro report through our tip 411 that we do have that was through the task force, or you can call the non-emergency line. If you're not sure that it's human trafficking, call the non-emergency line and make the report anyway, and someone will go out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. I just want to say thank you to the board for your continued support um, of consumer protections efforts to enforce the human trafficking ordinance. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Pictures.
And now we have citizens to be heard, number two. Uh, and I have a card for, um, let me just hold on here while I get my cheater so I can see what I'm reading. Major Dave Will. Mayor. 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 Oh, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I said to myself. That's fine. I shouldn't correct you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my name is David Will. This is Ian Boyle from Waste Connections. Um, I am one of the volunteers with Wreaths Across America, and I'm sure you're familiar with Wreaths Across America. They lay wreaths uh, at the Bay Pine Cemetery every Christmas season. Well, this season we laid 7,000 wreaths out at the grave sites. Uh, we have hundreds of volunteers that come out and help us do this. Then in late January, we go back to the cemetery. All those volunteers come back out again and help us pick them all up. But the situation we ran into is now what do we do with them? That's where I reached out to Ian Boyle from Waste Connections. I explained our situation. He said he'd love to help us out. He came out to the cemetery, took a look at the, well, the situation, and said he will bring out as many dumpsters uh, as we need, um, all free of charge. So then he said, well, there's one more piece to that puzzle. We have to dispose of them somewhere. And that's where I want to thank the administration at the Pinellas County Landfill um, and also uh, Brian Scott's office. Bobby Shea was instrumental in making this happen. And Ian had reached out to the administration, and they were able to waive those fees for us. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody involved with that situation. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You. Yep, uh, just wanted to thank thank the county. Um, it was a great event. Um, there's our, obviously, when disposal, you're working at two pieces, the hall, and then getting rid of it. Um, just so you know, it's 7.65 tons of wreaths. Uh, 7,000 in total. They had enough volunteers that were they were picked up in 30 minutes, which was pretty impressive. Um, but I just wanted to, I told the mayor, you know, obviously the first opportunity would come out, thank the county, thank uh, Jill Silverboard, Robert Mills, Paul Sacco, and then the other one, Christine Coveas at the uh, Solid Waste Department. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm thank hoping you. we can count on you guys again for next year. <laughs> you knew that was coming. Right? So. Thank you very much. Thank you. the Thank you. setting here. Thank you. Yeah, exactly right. Thank you. Uh, next is David Balagettis, Jr. Hi, good afternoon, Commissioners. David Balagettis, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. They bought and sold us, and nobody told us. Absolute bill of sale, full warranties of title, and release of county lien. Pinellas County Resolution 95-286, Section 4C-2, clearly states that the county has been sold to the Water District using a 30-year fee title transfer as reflected in statute law. The county ad valorem in absolute is no longer a county property tax lien. The Water District as the new seat of government, as a non-elected body of government, is intent on imposing its taxation in the form of a non-ad valorem levy based on statute 197.3632. The non-ad valorem levy is not based on the millage rate. The sale of the county is recognized as a self liquidation process in statute 163.01 and is further seen as a transfer of county function and power in Pinellas County Home Rule Charter section 2.04Q. In its absolute, the county is attempting to shapeshift itself from its fortnighted statehood into a politically laundered watershed operation using a quid pro quo agreement with the water district intending to double down on its deception, birthing itself as an unwarranted water jurisdiction under the 14th Amendment. Such unsovereign water jurisdictions are constitutionally ill-defined as districts not to exceed 10 miles square in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of our current Constitution. 
these 10 mile square jurisdictions hoping to reconstitute themselves in statute 373.715 are being manifested as downtown redevelopment areas and as reclaim water ready to serve zones. These individual independent privatized water jurisdictions are claiming eminent domain rights of civilian owned property intending to levy us out of our equity we have built up in our homes using water infrastructure scheming as their Second Amendment weapon of choice and are further intending to directly levy upon enslaving the civilian population stating that I literally owe my health my safety and my religious convictions as based on the reclaimed water variance carpet bagging us in chapter 159 of the Florida State Statutes. I suggest we exercise the court system for what it's intended to be and here is a second district court of appeals court case that I intend on handing to you today. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Greg Pound. <coughs> <clears throat> Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. I'd like to read a verse out of 1 Samuel, and this is what it says. It says, But there came a messenger unto the king, saying, Haste thee, and come, for evil people have invaded the land. The evil people there is the Philistines. They had no law. They didn't have the rule of law, the Ten Commandments, the very law that we live by and supposed to be in our court system. You know, you talk about tra human trafficking, you're, and that's using children for sex and so forth and so on. We got Chris Latvella, his dad, Jack Latvella. If you read it in the paper up in Tallahassee, what was going on up there with, with that situation and all your other politicians that are using children. And this, the lady that got up here the, in the uniform who said um, domestic violence, that's your code word to snatch the little children out of the home and get them from their parents. Now, I've been coming here for over 14 years and I've actually twice ran for sheriff. I won the second race by default because I ran against three attorneys, your present attorney, Robert Guattari, who shouldn't be the sheriff of this Pinellas County because he's still an attorney, which is against the Constitution, and that's a constitutional office. Greg Pound should be the sheriff of Pinellas County, and that can be proven in law. But you have a problem now. Since I've been inviting people like Mac Ray Johnson in here, an ex-Marine, He's, he, you go to Calvary Baptist Church, the one on McMillan Booth Road that used to be downtown, you go to the Seminole chapter and you go to the homepage and you look who's standing at the front door, Mac Ray Johnson, he's one of the pastors at that church. Now, since he's been coming here, you've sent the, count, the code enforcement. You, you, what you do, you can't get nothing on us legally, but you send your code enforcement to our houses and pick on stuff that you couldn't make up. He built his porch on his house 13 years ago, and now they want him to tear his porch off, and they've been harassing him ever since he started coming here, just like you did to me, the exact same thing until I was going to start to pull it out. I was going to, you, people need to be, you, you people need to be arrested for what you're doing behind the scene. People who, come up, people who come up and try to stand up for our rights, and you come after them like you do, the way you do things, it's like I call this thing, this um, planned demolition, someone plowing in the back of my car and, and trying to and messing me up. And so what I'm just saying is there's stuff that's going on in this county that's so evil crop for money, your love of money. The Bible says we're not to sell the truth. We're supposed to buy the truth and not sell it. It's not for sale. And I'm just saying we all have a sin nature, all of us. Every one of, every one of us are sinners. And until you get saved and born again and start looking out for the rights of this country, we need to get America born again. That means born in the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit. And if we don't do that, we're destroying ourselves. I mean, I, I'm no different than you guys, but I'm telling you, I'm saved. I got saved when I accepted Jesus Christ. And what you guys are doing to America, what you're doing to Pinellas County, and the people in here who are standing up for what's right and trying to defend what's right, like our families and children, biggest dollar in the U.S. court system is family court, destroying the families. Because then you got the father, the mother, and the children all stuck in your system. Thank you, Mr. Pound. Uh, next, we are on the consent agenda. Are there any items to be pulled from consent? Item 15, please. 15. Uh, and, I, and I really, uh, I'm supporting 12, 13, and 14, but I wanted to have staff take a, just a minute to let people know what we're doing for their infrastructure. So if they could just 12, 13, and 14, just pull for information for our, our okay. residents. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, do we want to vote on everything else? Move approval and remainder. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 So that's Commissioner Justice and Commissioner 
Eggers. For Thank you, Madam Chair. Second. And then on number 15, David? That was oh, Charlie. I'm sorry, Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I apologize for not asking this on Thursday because I wasn't exactly sure of the location. But we've had some issues with uh, flooding at the mobile home park just south of where we're doing this project. And I wanted to kind of hear a little bit of how that was going to impact that. Kelly. Morning, Kelly, or Good. afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Kelly Levy, Public Works Director. Um, it really should have no impact based on the city's um, m design and modeling. It doesn't show any any impact for better or for worse. Um, it's just really, um, yes, the culvert size is increasing, It's but really the, the volume is controlled by the size of the canal. Um, what ultimately will provide flood prevention and flood control benefits is the three phases of the project that we have going from pretty much from Tampa Bay to just, just north of that location where we're actually going to restore the channel, um, which is, you know, that is more of contributing to drainage issues that we're having, but the culvert itself. Okay. All right. Thank you. Move approval. Second. Everyone in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That's Commissioner Justice and Commissioner Eggers first. Yeah, so so 12 and I guess 12 and 14 are, are yours. So if you could just maybe just yeah. briefly speak to what they are, what we're hoping to accomplish with yeah. them, and just kind of let folks know how we're spending 11 and a half million, 30, uh, and $8 million a year on those two projects. So thank you. Sure. Um, so item 12 is um, award a bid to preferred materials, and that's for our countywide um, resurfacing program. Um, we have a, another contract, um, you know, in place as well. Uh, we have issued um, work on that contract. So right now, um, the bulk of work that's going to be issued under this contract for the remainder of this fiscal year is our local road resurfacing program. Okay. So Excellent. we are ready. As soon as this contract is in place, we are ready to issue that work. And that's the communities great. are really going to start we've to been, see that. We've been, uh, we've been doing well on the arterials and not so well on the neighborhood. So this is good. This is good news. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. I appreciate that. And um, so um, I move approval on that one. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Commissioner, did you want 13 as well or yeah, just 13 14? And 14? 13 and 14. 13 and 14, sure. Yours. Okay, so um, the contract with RJP is for um, contractual maintenance of our sidewalk, so sidewalk program. Um, as you know, uh, we were awarded $4 million in, in additional operating expenditures over uh, two fiscal years to um, address the maintenance backlog. Um, came forward a couple of months ago to add some additional money to the contract we had in place to keep that work going. This will continue that work, but also just be our mechanism for our ongoing contractual maintenance. Okay, move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. And item 14, um, in order to uh, implement some of the ARPA-funded roadway projects, um, we needed to put out separate contracts that have the federal requirements embodied in them. This particular contract is being awarded to Suncoast uh, Development uh, for that work. Um, because the line items associated with resurfacing themselves were higher, way higher than we would normally see, uh, we will be utilizing this contract to do the necessary drainage improvements, curb, and ADA compliance components of those projects. And we're working on a separate contract for the federal component of the resurfacing elements. Okay. So all of that, uh, what was it, 13 million? Is good. None of it's going to go for the roads. Uh, um, th we will be using four million dollars from that particular contract oh, to yeah. do the yeah. sidewalk drainage and curb work, and the remainder for the resurfacing will come from a different contract. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Move approval. Second. And moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Carolyn, you got the. I do, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Madam Chair, if it's so pleased, you can use the voice, uh, the card, the voting card. Okay, I wasn't sure it was up to voting. Okay. Four. <laughs> okay, moving forward. Uh, we are on item 21. Barry? <coughs> uh, good afternoon. This uh, first item is a, a First Amendment to Security Guard Services Agreement with Dynamic Security. Um, what this is going to do is allow us to use them for uh, portions of a, an existing contract that our current supplier cannot um, fulfill because of manning, uh, staff manning. 
you can see that this contract is higher, um, and that's part of the issue of their having problems getting staff. So um, this will fulfill that contract. We'll go out for bid with total um, for the total needs at a later time. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Peters. Um, so the company that we are already contracting, we've already paid them. No, the, the, we, they're they're paid on a as a per usage basis, but they and notified us that they can't fulfill portions of that contract. They can't supply the, man, the total manpower we need. Okay. This will allow us to break that apart and staff with this company certain locations and then allow Centron to fulfill the current agreement. Okay, and there's any accountability for that other organization? We're having issues with that all over. You've seen that in our mowing contracts. Uh, we've had to move those around. So we have to work with our suppliers based upon manpower. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Move approval. Second. Mike, would you please open the board and let us vote? Online's not coming up. I'm a yes. All right, that, that motion passes unanimously. 22. This is a purchase authorization for Precision Sidewalk Safety Corporation. This is to do trip and fall hazard prevention and maintenance on various aspects of our sidewalk system for just over $1 million. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Would you please open the card and allow us to vote? And that motion passes unanimously. Uh, item number 23. This is amendment number one to station 68 funding agreement with Palm Harbor Special Fire um, Rescue District. Uh, this takes this original agreement from $3.5 million to $6 million using $2.5 million of the American Rescue Plan funding. Um, as you know, project cost increases have uh, continued to stress all of these projects. This one is <laughs> no different. This is simply cost increase. There's no scope change um, uh, to this. And in some areas, actually, it's, it's been reduced. Uh, so this is addressing a uh, gap, and we're using the American Rescue Plan funds to close that. Chiefs in the audience, uh, if you have any questions. Move approval. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, would you please open the card and let, let us vote? I had a nice visit with them. And that passes unanimously. Uh, and now we're on number 24. This is an agreement with Oracle America. Oracle provides all of our um, ERP systems, our enterprise resource planning, which is, um, and this provides all of our software licensing. This is a maintenance agreement, uh, funding the amount of $1.3 million, total contract amount 1.4. Move approval. We have a second? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Commissioner Flowers, you have a I just wanted to throw in a huge thank you to our um, BTS team sitting way back there in the corner. We just talked about this yesterday at our BTS meeting, um, and I'm very excited to see that they looked at the scope of service and were able to kind of pull those dollar values in so that they were more reticent and aligned with the actual usage of services versus an overall general uh, dollar value that was way off base. So thank you so very much. Appreciate you for that. Thank you, Commissioner Flowers. <clears throat> All right, would you, would the clerk please open the uh, board and allow, oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and that passes unanimously as well. 25, County Attorney. Under item 25, I'm asking for authority to file suit in the case referenced on your agenda. This is a matter that arose from your code enforcement division. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please open the card and allow us to vote. It's missing. Okay. And that passes unanimously. Uh, item 26. I have uh, nothing to report. Thank you. Madam Attorney, County Administrator report? No report. No reports. Um, 
And now we have the county commission appointment to the auditor selection committee. And do we have ballots for that, yes. Darlin? Yes, ma'am, chair. Okay. We'll be, we'll be having one appointment out of uh, the names that we're receiving now. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, can I show you a pen? Okay. Oh, go ahead when you're done. Oh, I got another one here. Thank you very much. My name on there? Yes, it's on there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And we'll just wait for a second to for Darylin to add those up as we move to why don't we take up 29 by Commissioner Lat Valor that shouldn't take very long move approval second it's been moved and seconded would you please open the card and allow us to vote And Darlene, do we have the appointment of the? Um, Madam Chair, there was a, a tie between two of the candidates, so there needs to be a, another ballot take place. Oh, nice. by majority. Oh. So, yeah. is there just two people that we vote for at this time, or is it, the tie is between? I, I think that you all can follow whatever procedure that you like. I know that Daryl and I could probably tell you who the ties are between if you would like to eliminate the third yeah. candidate yeah, that received I think one vote. To hear that. Uh, you had two candidates that with three three votes each, correct? Correct. Right, and that's Amy Ratcliffe and Timothy Shelby. Okay. Isn't there seven of us? How can we have a tie? Well, somebody must have voted for the other one. Thank you. You had mm -hmm. one additional three vote one. for one additional vote for just one person. Thank you. It was three and three and one. That's how the vote came out. Oh, I see. Okay. We should do weighted ballots for these things. <laughs> you are so welcome. Thanks for being so prepared. No, my darling. No, my darling. Um, Madam Chair, the board has selected Timothy Shoby. Okay, congratulations to Timothy. And we are now on agenda item 30, which is an appointment by Commissioner Flowers. Commissioner Move approval. approval. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. And now we are on County Commission new business. So most of these are updates and policy considerations for your approval. And the first one is, I, I'd just like to ask the board if they want to continue with the way we have been doing these lightings for the uh, Skyway because we have now a resolution that is in your packet or should be in your packet or should have been sent to you, I'm not exactly sure. No. You don't no. have it? No, no ma'am. All right, then we will move that to our workshop next. But the resolution is to approve the list of all of the folks that we have heretofore voted to allow the bridge to be lit up for and uh, ask you to consider approving all of that. And then there's another little caveat in there that says, as long as someone making the request is on the pre-approved list, we can just go ahead and forevermore say yes. Um, you've all, I think you've all heard, and I think I've made my comments since uh, we have our new commission, that I think this is becoming unwieldy, and I'd like to know what the public purpose is most people that see the different lights on the Skyway don't have any idea what they're for. But I'll leave that up to the discretion of all of you and how you want to handle it. Commissioner Justice. 
I, I think having a list of standard ones is fine. It's fine with me as long as it's fine with the Department of Transportation because we had asked them before and they had indicated to us before that they wanted an individual resolution for every single time. Yeah. Right. So as long as DOT is fine with them approving how we ask them to light their bridge, um, you know, I, I'm fine with however procedurally makes it easier for you and your office. And Joel, you had the form. It was approved as to form from your office, yeah, right? Yeah, th this is something, um, just for information, that I worked with Nikki in your office on. Um, my understanding is, is that Hillsborough adopted this approach. I cannot report to you whether this has been blessed by DOT. Um, I will tell you, when I worked on that resolution, I was a bit surprised myself, even having approved all the resolutions that you've done, at just how many organizations are on the list. It's a lot. Um, so this was an attempt to basically say, if we've approved them before, they are considered approved for future <coughs> purposes. And then we were going to um, insert new language in any new request from a new organization or cause that would say they would automatically become part of your permanent list and then update that list probably every January. That was the approach that we were looking to take to try to streamline your, your meetings a bit more, at least in regard to these Skyway resolutions. Um, <coughs> what I would suggest is if you all wish to entertain that, that you take it up maybe at this evening's meeting, since you don't vote at workshops regularly, uh, since those meetings aren't noticed for purposes of voting. Um, it seems like you're going to have I don't want to jinx anything, but it seems like you're going to have a little bit of time between the conclusion of this meeting and the public hearings that start at 6 to the point that that resolution could be handed out. Again, it's just a restatement, I guess, as it were, of all the resolutions that you've previously adopted in regard to different requests that you have approved. And this past year, we, we voted for 22 of them. And the one we have for today is for... I, don't, I can't even tell you how you pronounce this. It's colonogia sonoma. It's an eye duct cancer. And I'm informed that DOT has approved the Hillsborough resolution that this kind of okay. omnibus resolution is modeled after. So they, so, excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes. So they, um, they don't bring it every year to approve the whole list, but once you're once you've been approved, then you're automatically approved every single year. The, the, that's how we're trying to structure it. That's the way the language in this more comprehensive resolution was drafted. And then, like I referenced, what what we're planning is on subsequent requests, subsequent new requests from organizations that do not currently <coughs> appear. On that master list, there would be language in indicating that they are deemed to be added to that list. And then the thought was that once a year, we would just bring forward a new one that lists everybody that, that you've approved in the past to make That's it clear. what I was getting at. So we will bring it once a year once to get the whole list, the previous and any new ones that we've I, added. I think that's a good I, measure to take so that yeah. you've got a single document that shows all of yeah. the yeah. prior I, I, approvals. I'm comfortable with doing it um, once a year, you know, and that in one list. But I do think it's important for these organizations because they do what they can to get pictures of these <coughs> and they use it for marketing, for, for public relations, for information. I think it's really important. We may not, we may not actually see the, the actual bridge lighting, but it comes back to us in pictures and brochures and all of that. So it is really important. So I think it's great that we continue to do it. Thank you. Okay, anyone else have a thought or an opinion? They, bought, they spent all that money to buy all those lights, light it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree that would be a lot easier to just do what you suggested. All right, so we'll bring that back uh, later. I'll have Cassandra get a copy out to all your offices for review, and then we can talk about it at the end of our public hearing tonight. That's what I would suggest. Is that good? Okay, and now we are on uh, Commission New Business, and let's start with uh, Commissioner Latvala. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Last week, um, JWB had the Children's Summit. Uh, f some of y'all were there. I know Commissioner Eggers was there, and I may be missing some other folks, and I apologize. Um, uh, they had a speaker, Dr. Uh, Snaith, uh, speak, uh, who's an economist from the Premier University in Florida, uh, <laughs> right down the road on I-4, uh, go Knights. Um, uh, they talked about a new initiative that they're starting, Turbo Babies, 
Uh, yesterday, JWB participated in a uh, press conference with the Surgeon General uh, on the Sleep Baby Safely expansion that they're doing. So JWB is doing a lot of stuff, and if they can have one of their board meetings that does not conflict with our meetings, I will greatly appreciate it. Um, but that's all I have. Did you mention Turbo Babies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is that? It's uh, for, so the first uh, thousand days of a baby's life, the 80% of their brain is developed. And so it focuses on the first, uh, I guess that'd be two and a half years of a baby's uh, life and, and their brain development. And How we keep evolving, because I remember a decade ago, it was the first four years of a baby's life. Yeah, so you need to tune in, uh, talk and repeat, uh, take turns, and take time. And I appreciate Commissioner Eggers for keeping the flyer on that. <laughs> that's a great, that's yeah. a great yeah. little public relations thing to put out, Barbara. There's a way we can weave that in to the things that you do. Thank you. Thank that. you. Commissioner Eggers. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention that, so thank you, Commissioner Latvala, for bringing that up. And the only thing I would add to it is they had a, an economist there, as you said, and um, he, uh, he's predicting a mild mm -hmm. recession, and, he's, and he has a good track record of talking about economic forecasting. And so he was, uh, he said, probably 6 to 12 months uh, coming out. So it'll probably come in this year, late this year, and then a 6 to 12 months uh, gradual improvement. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, at, at the uh, JWB thing, having a, a pretty robust discussion about economic forecasting. So a possible recession. Yeah, is what he called yeah, a it. A possible recession, but a mild, mild one. So, well, the only other thing I have is since we have a couple hours here, we could do the whole Tampa Bay water meeting. Uh, <laughs> no, got the you. agenda right here, and we can go through it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But I did want to just say a couple of things real quickly. Of course, I have to say a couple of things about Tampa Bay water. Um, um, I'll go right to the presentations. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, we just recently approved a new uh, water supply source. It's going to be an expansion of our surface water plant um, for, uh, for Tampa Bay water. And we're already starting to work on the next water supply project. And um, so that one had 120 different sources of water uh, that they were considering, and they narrowed it down to 40 already. And by the end of this year, we will select the next water supply project, which will be coming online probably in 2034, 2035. So you're always trying to get out ahead of water demand in this area. So a um, lot of good work. It's going to be a lot of busy meetings this year trying to w w uh, narrow that down. So. Uh, for those of us um, that love that kind of stuff, I'm kind of excited about it. Um, for those of you who don't, I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll keep keeping you up to date as much as I can. Um, and then uh, the Tampa Bay desal plant, which is one of our current water supply sources, which is, is pretty cool. They're actually doing a very detailed um, analysis of whether to bring the, the servicing of that, of that plant in-house or going uh, and selecting another uh, contractor. Um, right now, the contractor that's there is moving, along, moving on, doesn't want to do it any longer. And this is a big decision. Probably only two or three others in the world that do this work. So it's not like we have a big pool to choose from. Yeah. But that work is coming on. And uh, there was a brief water <coughs> quality update, which is really uh, affecting us more than other parts of the uh, Tampa Bay Water Group. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll give you uh, good uh, updates on that as we go through the next uh, year or so. But, uh, so Commissioner, I yes. have a mm -hmm. question. Yeah? Considering you mentioned there's only one or two or maybe three in the whole world who are doing this mm -hmm. kind of thing, I was curious if you were anticipating an exploratory trip to Dubai to learn how they do it there. Well, I understand it's one of the most sophisticated in the world. Well, I would love to. Cause I'm not the chair anymore. Like all the <laughs> other opportunities that when I was chair, they, we weren't traveling. And now, you know. So, no, I won't be going, but I'm sure that that um, consultant will bring it to us. So, yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. And also, maybe you could speak for the benefit of our new colleagues uh, how much they might learn by taking a little side trip to oh. the desal oh. plant and our reservoir that we have in supply. Yeah. Yeah, it's and while I'm talking about that, it also reminds me that 
Barry, we might want to have the manager from Crossbar Albar come give us an update because that's another thing that when I first came here, I didn't know that we owned, yeah. and it's quite a, I mean, it's quite a big deal. It's a pretty fascinating, the Tampa Bay water um, infrastructure. It's really almost all over in Hillsborough County with the exception of some of the well fields that are up in Pasco, some of our, some of Pasco County. And all of that comes, it kind of wraps around through Hillsborough County up to the north end of the county and then comes into our county for distribution. It's pretty cool, pretty amazing system. So you get a chance to get out there if you haven't done it already, do it. I remember when we were just when the That's we right. were talking about desal yeah. before the plant was built when I served on city council and now to see it, you know, because everybody was like salt water, yeah. turning salt water into drinking water, and and they do a good job of mixing all the different water sources so you don't really tell, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of technology improvements coming. So, so Commissioner Peters and I both are lucky enough to be on that board. Yeah, very nice. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do plan on getting out to tour uh, uh, Tampa Bay Water and Desal Plan. I, I find it very interesting as well. Um, I want to thank uh, Evan Johnson and, and County staff for the uh, successful uh, Lowman open house that they had. I think it was the week week before last, and I attended that. And uh, it's it's really kind of exciting, you know, to sort of see some real opportunity and momentum in the Lowman area now. And in the 40 years I've lived in Pinellas County, it used to be an area where you just kind of hit the gas to sort of, you know, get out of. And, and, and now it's really feels like there's some real possibilities <coughs> there. So it's, it's really nice to see that. And um, I'm kind of working on over the next, um, you know, probably a few months, try to set up some uh, community hours and very office hours in various parts uh, of the county just to be out and, and about and be able I to. I call um, them satellite offices. There you go. I like that too. Um, also want to, um, I continue my uh, county uh, listening tour visited the uh, supervisor of elections just in the past you know uh, week or so um dolly museum also want to thank uh, barbara st Clair at creative pinellas met with them yesterday had a nice meeting with them um also would like to welcome uh blue innovations group uh to the community as well they're the uh, uh electric uh boat boat builder that uh, they're not actually building them now but went and visited with them and and heard about their vision and their plan so it's that's pretty exciting uh, over in the lowman area as well which is also kind of kind of cool and also, um, I think I may have mentioned this during strategic planning, but I've accepted the role as chair for the Sixth Circuit Juvenile Juvenile Justice, um, which needs a lot of work. And I'm looking forward to uh, diving in and seeing what we can do there. So, so since you've met with that company, they have, they have the electric um, boats, right? Correct. You may want to ask Whit to serve on the Waterborne Subcommittee of Forward Pinellas because mm -hmm. we've been doing a lot of work on that issue as it relates to the Cross Bay Ferry. So that would kind of seem like a good synergy for you. Sure. Okay. Thanks. And you're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> oh, so sorry. As you all have heard before, um, the governor has decided um, to make some changes when it comes to um, career source and the number of vo boards that exist throughout the state, narrowing that number of boards. No specific decision has been made at this point, but we're going through the process of trying to determine um, which career source uh, boards will remain active, which ones will merge. And this happened before where there was a merger, if you all recall, it was Pinellas and Hillsboro, um, yeah. I vaguely remember that. And it, it, it didn't go so well. Um, it didn't go so well. And so while um, I have that historical perspective, I am moving forward, um, trying to be as open as possible. But I had a chance to meet with the EYI <clears throat> strategic group who is going about the state of Florida interviewing individuals. Um, it was a 45 minute interview and they asked a number of questions um, that um, all dealt with um, how we uh, provide services. They had our contract, they saw our numbers, they had the red and green report, so they asked about that. How are we closing the loop on services? How are we maximizing funds? What is our relationship with businesses? Um, so it was a, a very detailed interview, but um, I certainly was was very proud to share what we have been doing here um, in Pinellas County, and I am hopeful that um, Pinellas County will be able to remain as its career source board, working with the others um, in the jurisdiction. 
Um, I serve on PSTA as well as um, several other colleagues, uh, Commissioner Peters, Commissioner Scott, and Commissioner Latvala. So we had uh, an update um, and a conversation as to whether or not we will um, continue to um, have the Sunrunner provide services uh, for free for an extended period of time. The time requested was two years. I did not support a, a two-year uh, expansion on uh, no fare service on that route. It wasn't anything that we voted on. It was just to start discussions um, in that area. Um, originally, the route was to be free up through April of this year, so six months. <clears throat> so we'll be having additional dialogue, conversation, and discussion about that. Uh, a group of individuals from PSTA will be traveling to um, Tallahassee to lobby in support of funds for transportation, as well as traveling to Washington, D.C. Um, and it will be um, in alignment with the um, ACTA conference um, in Washington, D.C. Um, that is all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Justice, thank you <coughs> for flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question for uh, Mr. Burton. We, we all received an email from Congressman Castor's office that we would be receiving additional ERAP money. Is that going to go through the normal process, or do we have a, a plan for how we're going to spend that money? Come on up. <laughs> yeah, we were notified. Um, Tom Almonte, Assistant County Administrator. We were notified last week of additional dollars. Uh, we will be submitting uh, to receive those dollars, and then we'll be engaging in conversation with uh, Barry and County Administrator and others, how do we spend those dollars. Um, uh, St. Pete also received dollars, and uh, <coughs> so we are in conversation, so whatever we do is, is we are al aligning in how we spend those dollars. Okay. Obviously, the program administration of any program like this is the barrier to set it up, to uh, to staff it, to run it. Um, that's the reason throughout this entire process we've tried to work because of a person trying to access those funds. We don't want it to be different because it goes right next door into a different jurisdiction. So um, I'll wait their Not recommendations as they review that. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Madam Chair. Yes. O on that topic. First of all, I'm excited that we received them because within that letter, it stated the reason that she put us out there is because of our ability to expedite and provide those services to the community. So I think that speaks volume um, from staff, the staff perspective. I know we were trying to get a handle on how to get the applications in and get the money out as quickly as possible, meeting all the standards they require. So we had to back up. But I thought that spoke volumes because those funds came from another jurisdiction who did not spend all of their dollars. So I thought that yeah. spoke really well. And then I would hope that it wouldn't take a lot for us to get going because we had such a wonderful um, component in place before. It's just not as much money we're using this time. But we certainly have the ground structure in place to, to kind of make it roll out and make it happen. Yeah, and that's why we want to review it, just to initiate the entire engine for a small portion of dollars. So we, we're reviewing that with the staff in, in conversation with St. Pete. So whatever we do is going to be quickly mm -hmm. uh, because the dollars are very limited. So. I'm sorry, but oh, no, fine. To... And the manager just had one other question, <coughs> uh, not for, unless you want this one, Tom. <laughs> um, yesterday we saw the mayor select a uh, development partner for the gas plant site, and obviously that impacts the stadium development there. And some of the things, I've seen different stories, but pretty aggressive timelines on getting those things done. And I didn't know if we had a timeline of when we'd start talk, having that conversation. I, I'll bring back some recommendations and ideas to you. Um, I actually have a meeting at 4.30 <laughs> in between to uh, begin those discussions. Obviously, this is not new. As each of you know, we've engaged um, Inner Circle Sports to be our stadium consultant um, that we worked with um, um, St. Pete on. Um, so we have thoughts. This, But you really couldn't put pen to paper until you understood where the city and the mayor was going with um, the selection of a master developer. So mm -hmm. now those details, 
they begin to come together. And so that's what it's going to take. It's going to take both a look at the stadium, funding sources, commitment from the team, and how that fits into the overall project and, and the financial with that project. Um, so we intend on, we're meeting today to talk about next steps forward. Um, and we had this meeting planned in anticipation that we'd be able to get started. Very good. We, I know we've been talking about it for 10 years. I mean, longer than that, but 10 years. But we haven't really talked about it uh, at this board. And so that's why I was, and I just want us not to get caught in a situation where they come to us, the city or the team, and says, well, we've got to know by midnight that we're going to take our time, be deliberative, and go through it very detail-oriented. We've got the, um, the structure in place to be able to have that deliberate discussion and detailed analysis um, and be able to bring back ideas and thoughts to you. <coughs> um, and again, uh, I don't have a timeline. Um, I'm having a meeting today to talk about what are the next steps to be able to present to you um, a timeline and a plan. Very good. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And commissioners, we're almost done, but I have a few things that I wanted to just bring to your attention. Uh, first of all, I want to commend Commissioner Eggers for joining me at the ARC topping off ceremony in uh, downtown St. Pete about two weeks ago. I was really hobbling at the time. Anyways, it was a very, very informative meeting, and I can't wait for Dr. Johnson to come and just share with all of us together the uh, economic impact of having that innovation center <coughs> here in the south part of our county and how that will begin to transform that whole area down there. David, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I just I was excited about it. I think <coughs> they're, they're planning the ribbon cutting sometime in this summer, probably yep. July. And um, all the different, the thing that keeps sticking with me is all of the jobs that they're talking about creating or will be jobs, these companies that start there will be developing jobs really for our kids and our grandkids. I mean, not, not for any of us probably, but they're really, f you know, forward thinking entrepreneurs. Um, we don't even know what they'll yeah, be. We don't yet. know what they're going to be. We know it's kind of the industries in general, but that's about it. So it's kind of exciting. Looking forward to it. What I found remarkable in, in talking with Kathy Woods about it was the fact that they have <coughs> a Fortune 500 company, for heaven's sake. They have 43 employees. I just was stunned by that. So um, it just goes to show you don't have to be huge to be mighty. And I also would like to acknowledge Commissioner Flowers for her rise to stardom, making the front cover of our oh. back magazine. I thought that was pretty fun. And um, I didn't get to be on the front cover when I went <laughs> through that program. We were in Miami at the prep to the legislative conference, and we were on a boat tour to tour some of the um, swells and things that they were trying to do to help with flooding down there and we had to get off the boat because the storm came in and the I boat was that. rocking and so I was trying to get off the boat and it was going out so I was almost doing a split <laughs> so when I, I got off the boat I kind of did that little dance like I'm off the boat and I didn't realize that they <laughs> were going to do that. Anyway it was, it was cute so congratulations Renee. Thank you. And I did sign off on the letter to go to NACO for Commissioner or was it FAC? FAC. FAC for, to be the second vice president of FAC. Thank so you. So she's quickly rising and making a big difference in not only our community but throughout the state. And I wanted to thank uh, all of you and especially our new colleagues for your thoughtful and very um, interesting conversation at our strategic planning meeting that we had last week. I thought it was one of the best ones that we've had thus far. And as it relates to the raise and the discussions there, I mean, don't forget we have a joint TDC meeting coming up, and uh, that should provide some good, solid foundation for how we have all of the discussions coming forward this year. Right, Barry? Because it's not just the raise. We have uh, the DALI is coming forward with a pretty significant ask, and I understand so are the Phillies. And... Whatever else they have on their radar, I don't even know. Well, we'll have a very just learning. We'll have a very good joint TDC BCC meeting. I doubt the Rays will be in that discussion. We probably won't be ready for that yet. 
except at a high level for you guys. Well, I, I was just it. trying to outline some of the big things coming along that we have to think about sure. this, this coming year. And uh, I have a couple other items, but I haven't totally flushed them out with Miss Jewel yet, so I'll wait until we have our next workshop. You had something? Just a couple I forgot to mention. Just take a second. Sure. I don't mind. Yeah. You, you, brought up, you brought up strategic plan, and I just, I think it really was a good strategic plan. I really wanted to thank Barry and your entire staff that were participated in pulling that together because it really, it, it takes a lot of work to, to, to bring us in for a landing and at least have the conversation. And um, not that we all agree with everything that was brought forward, but I think it was really good discussion and just really wanted to say thank you. And uh, C Commissioner Scott brought up some of the tours he's had. And I was down at uh, the Blue Sky. Blue Sky? Uh, the veterans community. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it was really great. I mean, I think they have 88 units and there were 71 are dedicated to, to <coughs> veterans. And they said, oh, that Scott dude was here already. I said, he beat me here, huh? <laughs> so, yeah, so he's, he's out, he's out uh, you know, hitting the trail around the county. And then finally, just a quick tour of the St. Pete Free Clinic, uh, how they grew from the different locations. And now they're, they've got this new 30,000-foot facility. It's just amazing. Sister Mary Good Margaret work. would be so proud. Oh, yeah, all the different leaders of that organization over the years. Oh, Sister Margaret. Amazing, Freeman, yeah. amazing work. So. I wanted to thank them for uh, having us down there and seeing what they had. So that's all I had. Thank Excellent. you, Madam Chair. Did I already ask you? No, but I have nothing. So sorry. Oh, sorry. You're so quiet today. All right. Well, um, I guess if there's nothing further, then uh, with, with your approval, we will adjourn until 6 o'clock.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Board of County Commissioners public hearing for today. I'd like to uh, bring this meeting to order, if I might. And with that said, we are now on uh, item number 32, case number FLU 22-4. And Madam Clerk, would you like to introduce this for our people in the audience? That's why I should read 33 as well, right? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, agenda item number 32 is case number FLU 22-04. This is a request by Community Assisted and Supported Living Incorporated for a land use change from residential suburban to residential low on approximately 2.79 acres located at 13000 Park Boulevard in unincorporated Seminole. Sorry. Um, agenda item number 33 is companion um, and I have to swear everyone in so it's zone ZON 22-05 this is a request by community assisted and supported living incorporated for a zoning change on approximately 2.79 acres located at 13000 Park Boulevard in unincorporated Seminole from residential estate to multifamily residential conditional overlay with the conditional overlay limiting the number of residential dwelling units to a maximum of 20 that will include a combination of one and two bedroom units in single-story duplex and triplex residential structures. A clubhouse and other associate amenities will be included. The existing two-story structure is allowed to remain. Since this is a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. For those who are wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Signify by saying, I do. I do. Thank you. The item was this item was continued from December 19th regular meeting. The public hearings were properly advertised. Affidavits of publication have been received for filing. Uh, we have 12 letters. One petition with 144 signatures in opposition have been received. And three letters in support have been received. Thank you. <coughs> All right. And just to uh, outline the, the public comment section for tonight, I would like to share with you that the chair of the board has the right to limit the remarks of each speaker to three minutes or less. Based upon the number of individuals that have signed up to speak during the public comment tonight, the chair may at their discretion shorten the time available for each individual to speak to allow more speakers to be heard. If you have five or more members of a group may waive their time to one speaker to speak for up to 10 minutes, they must be in attendance to waive their time. Uh, if, the, if the board decides they want a presentation, staff always presents first. If the applicant presents second and should present the entire case, including rebuttal, <laughs> in no more than 20 minutes. If the applicant wishes, they can use some of the 20 minutes then save their remaining time after everyone else has a chance to speak, including our citizens. Persons with five or more members or a group may waive their time to one speaker to speak for up to 10 minutes. They must be in attendance to waive their time. All other speakers may speak for up to three minutes each, and Commissioner Peters is our timekeeper for this evening. So with that said, um, Barry? Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, this is a companion item to item 33. Uh, this item will be first, as uh, the clerk read, this item is a continuance from December 13th. Um, and given that we have opposition to this, I would request that we first start with a staff presentation. Fine. Thank right. you. Scott, you're up. Nope. <laughs> Guess not. Good evening. Good evening, Glenn Bailey, Zoning Manager. The subject property in this case is uh, 2.79 acres located at 13,000 Park Boulevard in an unincorporated Seminole area. We speak have uh, speak into your mic a little bit. <laughs> future land use map amendment from residential suburban, 2.5 units per acre maximum to residential low, which is 5 units per acre, acre maximum. And the zoning atlas amendment from RE, which is residential estate, uh, to RMCO, multifamily residential conditional overlay. Existing use is single family home and accessory structures. Proposed use is multifamily for persons with developmental disabilities. And as mentioned, the board uh, continued this case back on December 13th. Uh, 
It's requested by the applicants to allow them time to address some neighborhood concerns through changes to conditional overlay. Applicants subsequently submitted proposed changes to conditional overlay, and I'll go those, over those changes in a moment, and in, in addition to the rest of the requirements of the conditional overlay. So it's a maximum of 20 residential dwelling units. Prior to this, it was 21, so they reduced that by one. It's a combination of one and two bedroom units. Before is one or two or three bedroom units. It's for new single story duplex or triplex residential structures. There's an existing two story family, uh, two story <coughs> single family home that would remain. Uh, it's for independent housing for a maximum of 28 persons with developmental disabilities as defined by Florida statutes. That's primarily for people with autism, things like autism, um, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, things like that. Uh, it also includes permanent supportive housing services for the occupants only. Uh, clubhouse and other associated amenities will be included. Another change they made was that the required setbacks will meet or exceed those of the existing RE district. That's 25 foot front, 15 foot sides, and 120 foot rear. The normal sides, normally it's 20 foot setback to the rear for RE, so they went way, well beyond down the rear. Uh, for the RM districts, otherwise, without this, you could go as close to 10 foot front and 5 foot sides and rear. So they've uh, increased the setbacks. Here we see the location of the property <laughs> on the south side of Park Boulevard. And again, an unincorporated Seminole area. It's to the east, 131st Street North. Um, it's adjacent to a commercial and office node that's centered on the intersection of Park Boulevard and 131st Street. Uh, generally, across the street, you have two retail strip uh, commercial centers. You also have uh, various office, restaurant uses, gas station, a uh, mixture of 20 different parcels that have either office or commercial uses. On the east and south side, you see the single family uh, large lots uh, area where you have residential estate zoning, which requires a 32,000 minimum lot size. So it's a transition area kind of between that commercial node and the large lot single family to the east and south. Just a future land use map change. <coughs> On the left is the current uh, residential suburban land use, which is 2.5 units per acre. On the right is your requested change to the RL, <coughs> which is, is 5 units per acre. You see there are both residential suburban and residential low in the immediate vicinity. So it's not a major change there regarding the surrounding land uses that are already existing today. And the, the, the red is the commercial general of the retail and offices, and that purple right next to it is a general office uh, district and uh, residential office general land use. For the zoning atlas amendment change, again on the left is the existing RE residential state single family district. On the right is a change to the RM multifamily Conditional overlay district. And uh, the red and the pink are the pink is a commercial neighborhood, which is a lower amount, lower scale amount of commercial that uh, would otherwise be allowed in the C2 zoning across the street. Um, the blue is institutional, it's an assisted living facility to the east. And you see it's, um, and the yellow is basically your, your single family districts. The, the brown color is your larger single family districts. <coughs> Just looking at the subject property, uh, right on the sidewalk in front of the property along Park Boulevard, you see the existing home there against a large lot. Uh, the driveway directly connects to Park Boulevard. There are no, there's no other access to this property except from Park Boulevard. And the left, if you're looking east along Park Boulevard, uh, that home you see there and that picture is owned by the applicant that's directly next door. It's used for the same type of use at a smaller scale than this and adjacent medical office to the west, which is basically right on, right next to the property line in this case. The left, you're looking west along Park Boulevard, you see the commercial office node uh, around that signalized intersection of Park Boulevard and 131st Street North, and on the right is the shopping center, which is a Winn-Dixie grocery store and a couple other stores uh, directly across Park Boulevard from the subject property. Some additional information about the land use. The current residential suburban land use allows residential, agriculture, institutional, recreation, open space uses, again, two and a half units per acre. The 0 0.34 <coughs> area ratio for non-residential uses, that means basically if you had a, a property with 10,000 square, square feet, you could put a 3,000 square foot building on it. The proposed RL land use is the same uses, just uh, minus out to agriculture. 
That's five units per acre and a 0 0.4 FAR. The potential traffic impacts in this case and an additional 37 trips is pretty uh, de minimis in this case. Would have basically no effect on Park Boulevard. Some additional, additional information on the zoning. The current RE zoning allows single family residential uses and accessory agriculture so that people could have horses if they'd like to, chickens, things like that. Again, 32,000 square foot minimum lot size. The maximum building height is 35 feet. You have 20 foot, 25 foot front and 10 foot side setbacks and 15 foot rear setbacks. Proposed RM, conditional overlay zoning, would allow duplexes, triplexes for the development of disabled. Um, without that overlay, the RM district would also allow things like apartment building, they allow condominiums, things like this. So this is basically limiting it to only uh, duplexes and triplexes. All the buildings would be on one lot. Um, a minimum is 10 foot separation from the buildings from each other. Uh, new buildings would be one story in height, similar to what's allowed now. And uh, again, you see the larger setbacks that they're imposing through the conditional overlay. And the existing home would remain. Some additional information the applicant has uh, indicated an intent to do a f an affordable housing density bonus. That's a subsequent process that would come after this these uh, votes tonight, um, that's how they would get to the 20 units, otherwise they could not do so. Without the affordable housing density bonus, the maximum they could get is 14 units under the proposed RL. Right now they could get seven um, based on the land use itself. That's without going through site plan review or anything like that. And the development would be subject to full site plan review, staff, full staff level site plan review. As far as flood risk, the subject property is not within the coastal high hazard area. It's evacuation level D. There are no restrictions on this type of use for evacuation level D. I mentioned this, I'm going to re reiterate the surrounding uses. Uh, you got Park Boulevard, which is a four lane divided arterial roadway uh, connecting to the north. Uh, commercial office node to the north and the west. Large lot single family homes south and east. And the property to East Long Park Boulevard is owned by the applicant, and this proposed development can be seen as a transitional use from a higher intensity uses right next door and right <coughs> to the north, the commercial and office uses to the single family homes to the east and to the south. And this is something else that the applicant submitted uh, after you continued the case last month. This is a concept plan. This is not binding. This is for visualization purposes only. It shows you the minimum setbacks for the RE district. It shows you a potential allocation of where the buildings might go. They're proposing a large retention area and the, on the south side, hence the 120 foot setbacks they're proposing. That's where the retention pond would go. Uh, again, this is all subject to site plan review. So it's not set, it's not, it's not binding whatsoever. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, just a quick question on this slide. The <coughs> amenity clubhouse, is that the proposed the ex use of the existing home that's there? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Recommendation regarding the land use is FLU 2204. The proposed land use amendment from RS to RL is a subject property uh, fronts a busy arterial roadway with a mixture of uses in the immediate vicinity. The sole access is from Park Boulevard. It is not connected to any of the single family homes via a driveway or street. Provides a transition between the more intensive uses to the less intensive uses. Uh, it will continue to be limited to residential type uses and it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. And the Development Review Committee staff recommends approval. And at the local planning agency uh, meeting in, I believe in this, in November, they recommend the denial. <coughs> and recommendations regarding the zoning case, ZON 2205. Uh, proposed zoning amendment from RE to RMCO is again, it's in a transitional location fronting an arterial roadway. Sole access from Park Boulevard. The conditional overlay provides assurances as to the future use of the property. It's not within the coastal hazard area. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan. Development Review Committee recommends approval. And the local planning agency recommends denial of three to two votes. Keep in mind that those recommendations were made prior to the proposed conditional overlay changes. So I don't know if that would have made a difference. If you have any questions. Questions by the board. Anyone? Yeah. Mr. Eggers? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just making it clear, um, under um, RE, there are allowed seven units? Seven units per the land use. The 32,000 square foot lot size for the RE, they could get three. Okay. 
if you didn't change either one. Either the land use or the zoning. Right now, they could build up to three. Okay, all right. Um, and we have, um, right now they're saying eliminating 28 folks for the 20 units, right? Correct. So and, and there's, do you know the sizes of the those buildings that we see? We have no idea what those are. I know that's. All right, maybe the applicant can okay. speak to that. Um, and, and just from a definition standpoint, could you talk to me what the definition of spot zoning is? Spot zoning is not really defined in our code, to my knowledge, but it's basically where you would have a zoning district that's set apart from the other, any other like zoning districts. Around? Yes. Now, I say there is RM zoning just to a few blocks to the east on both sides of Park Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Also, the C2 zoning across the street where the Wind Dixie is would allow multifamily residential. I have a follow up. Yes, Commissioner Peters. So, on the spot zoning, you said we don't have a definition for that. How often have we done this? I can't say how often we've done it. It's, I'd have to research <coughs> that. Okay, but to your knowledge, the last year or two, we haven't? We do it a lot along the scenic non-commercial corridors when we do institutional uses, such okay. as ALFs, churches, okay. that are surrounded by residential, so it does happen. Okay. All right, thank you. Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, so we've gone from 20 units, from 21 units to 20 units. They removed only one unit. Right. And that would be and, dependent on the affordable density bonus. Right. Um, and I know the conversations that we had before regarding density, I see the traffic impact would be negligible almost. So what would removing that one unit, what's the difference? It's really not much of a difference from the original. Okay. The main difference is the setbacks. And the rear setback um, being proposed from the, I guess it's from the last unit to the back of the property Correct. is... Um, it's 120 feet. Okay, and on the and on the sides, it is. It is 15. 15. Okay. And that's north of that 120 feet. So, so it goes. You can't have anything in that south 120 feet from property line to property line, as far as structures. Structures. Right. The ponds. The pond. The pond can, can be there. there. Okay. Um, Right. So if you see, can you see my screen on this, the land use here? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have three single family lots on the south side, primary that one, you see most of it, you have a corner down there as well. So it sees three lots here. So those three lots would be 120 feet away from any building. This lot here would be, would have 15 foot setbacks outside of that south, 120 feet. That's a single family home as well. This parcel here is owned by the applicant. Okay. And this one here is the uh, medical office. So. Okay. And Madam Chair, Thank I had you. A, yes. So if <clears throat> it were not homes for the developmentally disabled, but someone just wanted to build apartment units, townhome, condo, how many units could they get on this property? That without depends. requesting a density bonus. It would be without a density bonus, 14. 14. If you got, if you approve the land use change, it would be 14. Right now, there'd be seven. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Okay. Is that it? All right. And now I assume we are in the posture to hear from our applicant. applicant. So would the applicant like to come forward, please? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Angela Halber, and I am with the law firm of Hillward Henderson, um, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard in Tampa. We also have a Clearwater office, but I'm usually in the Tampa, so I'm saying that tonight. Um, we represent CASEL, which is short for Community Assisted and Supported Living Incorporated. They are the applicant, and they are the owner of this property. Um, what they're proposing, as you've just heard, is a very limited, low-density residential development for adults with developmental disabilities. We're also calling that sometimes tonight IDD, which stands for Int Intellectual and Developmental Delayed. Disabilities. Um, the <coughs> proposed plan, we're requesting both a, an amendment to the future land use map to go one tier up 
from residential suburban to residential low and to accompany that with a rezoning that allows multifamily, in this case duplexes um, and triplexes, with a conditional overlay. That conditional overlay is what customizes the zoning to make it fit on this particular site. So the question that Ms. Flowers just asked um, about the what could be allowed on this site would be limited by the zoning. So anyone else who ever, if, if approved, anyone else who ever wanted to do something different than what's described in the conditional overlay would be limited to that and would have to request another rezoning. Um, as you've just heard, the county staff is continuing to recommend that this be um, approved, that both the land use map change and the rezoning be approved. And um, after the LPA hearing, we, the, uh, the applicant engaged um, a consultant who is very familiar with the local area, Robert Pergolizzi. He is here to talk about the details of the proposed conditions, the updates that we've provided, and why we believe that those are suitable for this specific site. He's also going to talk about what would be allowed in this zone without the land use amendment and without the rezoning. Uh, that said, I want to hit some three important points. This <coughs> proposal does three really important things for this area. This is a mixed use area as it exists today. You will see if you look at that map when Mr. Pergolese comes up, there are multiple colors on that map. That is an indication that there are multiple different types of land use and zoning that already exist in this area. This particular proposal provides housing that is compatible with the surrounding area. It's consistent with the goals, policies, and objectives of the comprehensive plan. And it also provides desperately needed housing to people who are in need of affordable housing, in need of independent living, and who have, who are adults with developmental disabilities, which is incredibly, you're going to hear about why that's an incredibly underserved need in this community. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Pergolese to talk about the details of the plan. Following Mr. Pergolese, we have Scott Eller, who is the um, CEO of the Applicant Castle. There's one other thing that I need to mention. Sorry, I didn't realize I was on the front page there. Um, we have letters of support that I'm not sure have been entered into the record, and I would like to do that now. Good evening. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, Commissioner. Uh, good evening. I'm Robert Pervalizzi. I'm a principal AICP planner and <coughs> professional transportation planner with Gulf Coast Consulting. 13825 Icott Boulevard, Suite 605, and I've been sworn. Uh, I was brought on to this project uh, in mid-November after the LPA hearing to provide a planning analysis report and also a conceptual development plan for the conditional overlay. Um, as stated, we seek to uh, a land use plan amendment from RS to RL, uh, a tier one on the countywide plan. Uh, and rezone from RE to RMCO with a conditional overlay to provide for affordable housing for single-family attached dwellings, functioning as independent living. Uh, the area is mixed-use and unincorporated Seminole, located along a major arterial, Park Boulevard, contains a wide variety of retail, office, and residential uses, and as such, this land use plan amendment and rezoning request is reasonable given the self-imposed limitations of the conditional overlay, in my opinion. Uh, can you see the aerial photograph on the? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll go through. Uh, the subject site's developed with a large two-story single-family home with accessory buildings. Uh, the property is severely underutilized. Uh, to the north, we have Park Boulevard, a four-lane divided arterial. Across that is uh, commercial uses with a CVS on the corner, a Wells Fargo Bank, Portobello Square Shopping Center, and a Winn Dixie uh, grocery store, all with. Um, CG land use, which is shown in red, and a mixture of C1 and C2 zoning. And then also to the north is uh, single-family homes having RL land use and R2 zoning, 
and that is what is shown in green over here on the north side. On the south, immediately south of the subject site are homes with RS land use and RE zoning. Those homes, it's important, front on 74th Avenue, which is the next major road to the south, the, ne the next road to the south, 74th Avenue, also known as Old Oak Hurst Road. Uh, and, the, you know, they have RS and RE, RS land use and RE zoning. To the east, we have a detached home used for independent living that is owned by the applicant on land use having RS land use and RE zoning. And further to, the, and there's a few homes with that same land use and zoning. And further to the east on the corner of 128th Street <coughs> is Oak Tree Manor, which is an assisted living facility. And then finally to the west, immediately to our west, we have Max Health Medical Office Building with ROG land use and GO, general office zoning. It's a, it's a medical office, and that's shown here in purple on the land use and zoning map. And then as you go further west towards the commercial <coughs> node of 131st Street, we have uh, retail stores, Jodo's Pizza, a gas station, and to the south of that, uh, office building, and then even further to the south is another ALF, Greenbrier Manor. Uh, in my opinion, the rezoning to RMCO with a land use plan amendment to residential low is appropriate for this parcel which fronts on an arterial roadway and can serve as a transition between the heavy commercial to the north and west and the lower density residential to the east, south and east. Uh, the use of this property for the intended purposes of affordable housing for 28 dis developmentally disabled residents in a residential setting that can be harmonious with the adjacent residential development. It is consistent with the residential low land use category. Uh, the site meets locational criteria for RL, having minimal impact on adjoining uses, being low density, residential in nature, serving as a transition, and is not within a 100 year floodplain. Water and sanitary sewer service is already provided to the site. The transportation impacts are minimal, as you noted, Commissioner. Uh, adjacent segment of Park Boulevard between 113th Street and 131st Street operating at level service D, carrying about 25,000 vehicles a day. <coughs> and as you go west of 131st Street, uh, it operates at level of service C, carrying about 15,000 vehicles a day. Based on ITE, Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation 11th Edition, 28 residents would generate a total of 92 daily trips, 11 a.m. peak hour, 12 p.m. peak hour, which as staff noted is 37 more than what could be generated today on the current land use. Uh, I want to point out that the site is in flood zone X. It's out of the 100 year floodplain. The site is in hurricane evacuation <coughs> zones D and E. The south half of the site is in zone D, the north half is in zone E, which are rarely required to evacuate. Uh, as a matter of fact, the site slopes from north to south, things elevation 23 up by Park Boulevard, sloping down to 18, 19. Uh, at the south property line, and the water would naturally drain that way, which is why the proposed pond is on the south end of the site. Um, in looking at the comparative impacts, conditional overlay would limit to 28 residents. The proposed RM rezoning, as modified by the conditional overlay and concept plan provided, will be compatible and in harmony with the existing residential. I want to go through the bulk regulations for the RE, which is the current zoning, the RM, and then the RM with the <coughs> conditional overlay that we're imposing. As far as height is concerned, in RE, the maximum height is 35 feet. In the RM zoning, you can go as high as 45 feet. However, with the conditional overlay, we will be limiting ourselves to one story for the new buildings. The existing home is two stories. Any new buildings would be one story, so they'll be less than 35 feet. In fact, the, the owner tells me they'd probably be between 15 and 20 feet in height. The front setback in RE, it's a minimum of 25 feet. In RM, it, that gets reduced to 10. However, with our conditional overlay, we're going to use the RE regulation under the, that the current zoning would impose, a 25-foot front setback. Same for the sides. RE requires 15. RM allows you to go as low as 5, which is probably a little light in this case. 
and we are going to use the 15, committing to use the 15 on both the west and the east sides. And then finally, the rear setback is 20 feet in the RE zoning regulate zoning district. It can be reduced to five in RM without a C, without a conditional overlay. <coughs> However, with the conditional overlay, uh, I'm showing 127 feet as measured, but the condition does read 120 in case there's any issues that crop up. Um, as I stated earlier, uh, the retention pond would be on the south end of the site, which provides an enormous buffer to those to the south. And um, finally, the open space, you're allowed to, you, you have a um, maximum ISR, impervious surface ratio, of 60% in RE and 40% open space in the RE zone. In the RM, you're allowed to go to 90% impervious surface. Uh, what this plan shows here is we're at about 40% impervious surface with 60% open space, a tremendous amount of open space. Um, per section 138, 1200 of the Land Development Code, the purpose of the conditional overlay is to provide additional limitations to the underlying zoning district to ensure compatibility with surrounding uses. We believe we've done that here. The conditional overlay, as proposed, will invoke several limitations identified in the code. These limitations are on the uses that would otherwise be permitted in the RM zone, limiting the maximum height, increasing the minimum building setbacks, and reducing the impervious surface ratio and increasing the open space. These conditions will be consistent <coughs> with the RE regulations, and therefore the proposed setbacks will meet or exceed, exceed these setbacks under the existing RE zoning. We're doing all of these. I'm proposing to do all these. And uh, your code allows the board to approve with conditions. So in summary, the land use plan amendment from res residential suburban to residential low and the rezoning to, from RE to RMCO with specific limitations on the conditional overlay is compatible with the adjacent zoning districts and development in the area. <clears throat> the project, which fronts on an arterial roadway, a four-lane divided arterial, uh, can serve as a transition between the heavy commercial to the north and west and the residential to the south and east. I also should point out that I believe code requires a six-foot high fence along the east and south sides where we abut single-family residential. The uh, development team has had conversations with the neighbors, and we believe some of their objections are unfounded. Um, we've developed our concept plan to address their concerns, and we've got conditions of approval that are generally based on the plan, limiting the resident, well, Gwen went through them, limiting the residential units to a maximum of 20, one and two bedroom units only, Developmentally disabled persons, maximum of 28. Permanent supportive housing services offered only to residents. The height of the structures being limited to one story. The front, side, and rear setbacks specifically <coughs> of 25, 15, and 120 feet, respectively. Your staff's recommended approval, and we sincerely hope you will approve this. I will introduce you to Scott Eller, who is the property owner. and be able to answer questions. Good evening, Scott. You have about five and yes. a half minutes to go. Good evening. My name is Scott Eller. I'm the founder and CEO of CASEL. So my, we founded this organization back in late 1998 to accomplish uh, affordable housing for uh, two groups of people with disabilities. One part of the organization houses people with you know, mental health issues and co-occurring disorders, and the other part of the organization, which is what we're doing here, is going to be housing people with developmental or intellectual disabilities, as, as we described. When we endeavored on this in 2017 on the property next door, the idea was is to eventually find a way to expand our mission in Pinellas County. As you're going to hear from other people today, that there's a significant deficit of housing, especially affordable housing for people with developmental disabilities. As a matter of fact, right now, as we sit here talking, uh, the wait list in the state of Florida is over 20,000 and growing daily, which is alarming. And for the first time in a number of years, I'm now getting referrals from homeless shelters where we're finding people with developmental disabilities living there. And so we came up with a site, and we thought this was perfect because of the fact that it has access to shopping. <coughs> and with the type of financing that we get for this, you have to have access to doctors, access to shopping, access to community amenities, 
uh, bus routes, uh, trans other types of transportation, and support services from different providers. So the way it works in this type of program is we are the property owner and manager, and we build these little communities. And then we work with a variety of different providers that are certified through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities to provide the overlay services that are essential for people to live an independent lifestyle. So when we had the original meeting, we heard the concerns of the neighbors, and the concerns that we saw was reasonable concerns we addressed. We originally planned on 11 units. We pulled it back to uh, 20 units or 10 buildings. Because of those discussions, we wanted to create as much buffering in the back of the property as we could. And even on the site, um, the state even has further requirements that 80% have to be one bedroom units and 20% maximum two bedroom units. So in this particular case, the one bedroom units will be about 700, 750 square feet per side. So the one bedroom duplexes will be around 1,500 square feet. And the aerial map that they showed you that, that, was, that was color coded, um, the footprint of the duplex is actually a lot larger representation than what actually would be there because they're, about, they're going to be about a third of the size of the clubhouse. The two bedroom units we have are going to be around 2,000 square feet in total. And we, like I said, we, we operate right now in 10 counties, but with people with DD, we operate in uh, Sarasota, Manatee County, and also Pinellas County. And we hope today to, to seek your approval for this development, which is much needed for this community. Thank you. And we would like to reserve any remaining time that we have for rebuttal and response. 2.36. Okay, that would be two and a half minutes, or two minutes and 36 seconds. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want to do questions to the applicant, or? Uh, do we have questions of the applicants first from the board? I just have a couple. Commissioner Justice. Thank you. Assuming, let's say everything goes great and gets approved tonight, when would the doors <coughs> open? It'll take around two and a half to three years. Uh, because we have to get the rezoning process done, we have to go through architectural, we have to apply for the funding, we have to go through credit underwriting, which takes six to nine months, and then from that point, we would begin construction, and we typically allow about a year and a half for complete construction to turnkey. Uh, so then you're just you're counting on the the waiting list of folks that would need this facility. There's not like 20 folks right now that you had in mind. It's the longer term process. Well, it's a longer term process in that we wanted to design this community to best fit the needs of the people that we're serving. And we didn't want to do like an it'll do where we just buy single family homes and try to make them work. And, you know, we've, we've done that, but that's not what the people are wanting or needing or that's not what they need to really thrive at, at their best. And also this drives with the funding that comes through the state for this type of housing program. So, and also keep in mind when we do these developments, there is a land use restriction agreement on these developments for 50 years. So for 50 years, we cannot change the use of the property. And so this is really a, a long play, but with the referral networks that we have and the relationships we have with providers, we could fill 10 of these things uh, quickly. Sure. As a matter of fact, we just uh, were doing a development in Lakeland, Florida, and in 30 days, we had 4,044 people register for interest into the development. In an opening day, in 35 minutes, we had 150 people sign in and schedule appointments for 88 units and with complete applications. So this, this, the, the, the issue we're discussing is, is, is growing at an alarming rate, and we're just trying to plan for the future and, and grow with it. Very good. Thank, thank you very you. much. Anybody else? Keep us before. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I heard this in the, in the presentation, but just wanted to confirm. It would be a six-foot uh, vinyl fence around the, the whole event, uh, whole property? Mm -hmm. or. East. Yes, the and code requires a six-foot fence on the east and south sides where we abut the single-family residential. East and, and south, okay. Yes, and then my plan after the six-foot fence also is to put a line of either like a Rica Palms, mm -hmm. which can grow at about 14, 15 feet, which provides more buffering, or like a Podocarpus hedge. The Podocarpus hedge uh, takes longer to grow, but you can grow those to about, you know, 10, 12 feet without too much trouble uh, to provide a nice, dense uh, privacy barrier as well. Okay, and then um, did you say you had other... Uh, properties in Pinellas County? We have the property right beside it at 12948 Park Boulevard. We okay. opened that one in, I believe, August of, 19, of 2017. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on the board? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Flowers. My first question to Jewel. Of course, several of the letters um, seem to be a format that several people use, but they address some of the, what I call, health safety issues. Um, 
I don't think we can make a decision based on that because that can be handled in another arena. Mm -hmm. But there was one component in here about um, a property that they supposedly own that's across the street that has not yet been completed. Can we question about that and take that into consideration when it comes to their ability to complete this project? I think that your question to the applicant about their experience in the community and running uh, facilities of this nature is relevant. Um, you know, you're right. Some of the, the commentary about we like it or we don't like it isn't necessarily relevant to this. Your primary consideration is whether the request that they're making is consistent with your comprehensive plan. Uh, but I do believe you can question the applicant about other properties they own and manage. Okay. So my question is there's some concern about your inability to complete projects timely. Um, specifically a project that is being said that you own that's across the street from this project. Do you own any property that's across the street from this project or in the vicinity of where you have not yet completed that project and it's still an unfinished no. project? No, we own 1294 <coughs> Park Boulevard and we opened it on schedule uh, and on time. Okay. Um, there are some other concerns, and, and I come from a social service background, so I'm very familiar with okay. dually diagnosed patients, mm -hmm. making sure that some who are at the high end of schizophrenia are not mixed into communities where persons no. may have other, just let me finish. I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay, because yeah. I may have some other diagnoses that could lend to depression and some other diagnoses. So for the patients or for the individuals residing in your properties, on your properties? Do you have staff that's located on site or are these persons um, supposed to be able to care for themselves at a nominal level without supervision directly on site? <clears throat> well, we're gonna have management staff there, you know, during daytime hours. Now, as far as the needs of the people who live there, uh, through APD, they have the Home and Community-Based Support Waiver Program, HCBS, uh, which you'll hear from some of the providers today. And from the assessments that are done through uh, provider agencies with APD, they will assess the level of need of the people for housing. The people that will be going into Independence Place will have to be able to support themselves in independent living with basic supports like a supported living coach or coordinator from a provider agency. Okay. And that, that, and that is separate <coughs> from CASEL. Okay. And so for your one bedroom, two bedroom, is that one person or like for your two bedroom? Because there are some that we have in our community where there may be a total of four people in that one particular unit, two to a room, and they share the kitchen and living room as common areas. Is that how you're op you operate, or is it different from that? It's different. So <coughs> with the type of funding we receive, we are income limited per property. So let's say we have a one-bedroom unit, and it's a 35% AMI unit, area median income. If you put two people in there, you're going to be over the threshold, which is going to have a noncompliance with the state. So we, we do not have a history of doing that, and we cannot do that. It's going to be one apartment, one person, a two-bedroom apartment, two people. Okay. Um. So like the house next door at 12948, it's a four-bedroom house and we have four individuals. Okay. Um, that's all I have for right now. Commissioner, Thank you very much. Commissioner Peters. <coughs> Hi, and I want you to clarify something. And after I read the, you have an unflattering article from Fox 4 out of Lee County. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this, Bob. Uh, one of your residents that passed away and was there three days and another resident found him. So the managing staff that was on there had no idea that the person passed away. And in that article, it was very unflattering on how, <clears throat> and I don't, I want to make sure you're clear, you're telling me somebody else does the management, uh, the behavioral management and that kind of thing, and it's not you, you just provide the housing. Am I clear on that? On that uh, piece that was done, the client was under the care of a FACT team, Florida Center of Community Care okay. Treatment Team. And that duplex, we were simply the landlords. We did not have any active role besides being the landlord in the duplex. Okay, so at this property, are you gonna be a landlord only and you're gonna have another agency do the services or are you doing the whole, the whole, the whole thing? We are not doing the whole thing. 
The difference between this <coughs> and scattered site, when you have a bunch of scattered site units that are in a, like a, you know, 20 mile radius, it's hard to have management at each particular site. But this one, like I said, we will have uh, daytime staff there and on call staff for the management of the property. The supports are done by agencies through uh, that are that are licensed and contracted through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think you answered my question. I did. I did read the article very thoroughly, and and um, I did. You know, they did say how many times the police came to your 19 properties in Lee County. Uh, but it was over a three-year period, and and given the population, it was 12 and a half times for each individual property, but over three years, which only makes it four times per each property if you look at the average. So, you know, after you dig down into the article, it it didn't seem as bad once you dug into it as it did on the surface, because it was a very unflattering article. Um, well, but I do have, news. yeah, I do have some question for staff, but I'll ask that later if that's mm -hmm. okay, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Madam thank Chair. you. Yes, Commissioner Lotwell. Uh, thank you for being here. I believe you said that there's four residents that live in the property next door. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, has there been any law enforcement calls at that property? None. And on our housing that we have in Manatee and Sarasota County, in Manatee County, we've had in eight years no 911 calls. This is for our development disability housing. This is separate from our mental health. In Sarasota County, we have like 25, 30 properties, um, and we have uh, on about half of them over an eight-year period averaged three 911 calls in an eight-year period or one 911 call every two and two-thirds years. And that was typically like if there was a caregiver and they were having a medical um, mm -hmm. issue. Anything else? <coughs> Mr. Eggers? Not right, not right now. Okay. Anybody over here? Commissioner Flowers. Do you have any, um, are any of your contracts woven through ACCA? I have an assisted living facility in Sarasota, Florida, okay. uh, where it all started back in 1995 when I began this endeavor. Have you ever been put on a corrective action plan through ACCA? No. No, okay. and our last uh, three surveys have been deficiency free. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. <coughs> for the moment. All right, and now we're going to hear from our proponent. Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if we could, um, just to be clear, I think the clerk and I saw some folks come in uh, after she did the swearing in, so maybe if we could have any audience member who does intend to offer comments on either of these two companion cases that are being heard together, if they were not sworn in by the clerk earlier, now it would be the, would be the time to do so. Anybody need to be sworn in that did not get sworn in, okay? Okay. Anybody else? Speak now. All right, go ahead, Madam okay. Clerk. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please signify by saying, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much for keeping us in the correct <laughs> posture. Okay, as yeah. to the proponents, I have Ryan Krampitz. Is Ryan Krampitz here? Okay, Ryan, hold on one minute. Is Amy Colon here? Amy? Barbara Hewitt? Okay. Dakota Cole? Okay. And James Shelton? James Shelton? Okay. All right, so uh, Ryan Krampitz is speaking for five folks with he included and he will have how many ten, ten minutes. minutes please come forward state your name and your address and your comments thank you very much for being here all of you that he's representing thank you, sir. hello commission thank you for having me as a Hold on one moment let's get you in the proper format here all right continue please again thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of people with this course my name is Ryan Krampitz. My residence address is 105 Valencia Circle, St. Petersburg, Florida, and the zip code is 33716. Welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my words today are in support of the service uh, to, for all service providers. Hold on, please. Hold oh. on. Something is going amiss with our little... Okay. Okay. Continue. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, so, like, I, like I, as I was saying, my words today are in support of all service providers that support one of the largest subgroups in the world. In relevance today, uh, a group by the name of Castle. 
Um, as you're aware, people with developmental disabilities constitute of the largest minority group in the United States, making an estimated 26% of total population, consisting of estimated 61 million adults. It's a diverse group, crossing eight lines of age, gender, race, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. People with disabilities cons constituted the nation's largest minority group, and the only group of that any of us can become a member of at any time. Between 1990 and 2022, the number, the number of Americans with disabilities increased by 25%, outpacing any other subgroup in the U.S. population. People with disabilities represent the single largest minority group seeking employment in today's marketplace. <coughs> of the 69.6 million families in the United States, more than 20 million have at least one family member with a disability. According to the U.S. Department of Education, workers with disabilities are rated consistently as average or above average in performance, quality, and quantity of work flexibility and attendance. Over 65% of work-aged work adults with disabilities are unemployed. Of these working adults, nearly one-third earn an income below the poverty level. People with disabilities are nearly twice as likely as people without disabilities to have an annual income of, of $20,000 a year or less. The unemployment rate of people with disabilities is 10 times greater than the national unemployment rate. Yet many of those unemployed individuals have the skills many employers need. One billion people globally report having a disability, and the people with disability and people with disabilities in the U.S. control an aggregate annual income of over one trillion dollars. That's just in the U.S. Globally, people with disabilities represent an emerging market on par with the size of China. Approximately 54 million Americans have at least one disability, making them the largest minority group in the nation. As our baby boomers population ages and more veterans return from war, the number will double in the next 20 years. We have a personal stake in this community and is, is, to open, is to open it to anyone who might experience an accident, illness, genetic dif difference, or the effects of aging, and yet foundation uh, centers report that, uh, that over $3 billion spent in philanthropic giving, only 2.9% of grants made by institutionalized philanthropy are directed to programs with people with de developmental disabilities. According to the census, of the 49.7 million non-institutionalized individuals age five or older who reported having a disability in the U.S. Now, I'm here to tell you that without the support of organizations such as Community Assistant Living Castle, Penelope's Care Systems, the Gini Program, Park, and several others that are con also contracting with the state of Florida under their own set of rules, um, the procurement of affordable housing and navigating today's job market and experiences experiencing interdependence will make it essentially impossible to integrate people with disabilities into our fine communities. We all need support, the support of our families, friends, communities, figures such as yourselves. What I'm asking for is support for programs who are tirelessly, uh, tirelessly working towards people for supporting people with to integrate um, and become proud of in their success through their being a positive part of their communities. We call that supporter living. Uh, Florida Statute 393 defines support living as a category of indiv individualized determined service designed to coordinate in such a manner as to provide assistance to adult clients who require an ongoing supports to live as independently as possible in their own homes and to be integrated into the community and to participate in community life to the full extent possible. Some of the characteristics of our great state for support living are people control their own homes, people define their own lifestyles, uh, providers, like myself, we use new ways to listen. People exercise control and choice regarding supported su supports and services. And service providers use flexibility in, in service delivery. As a set of communities and locales, we must evolve from what we have been allowed to live, and has been, I'm sorry, we must evolve from what we've been allowed to live as, as we have in decades past. People with disabilities shall be afforded the same rights and privileges as and experiences as those without. It is not about merely finding a home, but it's about making a life in it. Castle affords that. Um, so in supporting programs that advance the focus of, and as, on assisting people with disabilities, we, we must change the way that we approach barriers presented by this ever-growing subpopulation. People with disabilities require the support of our communities in order to be afforded the same opportunities that we all have and the privilege that we all have the privilege of experiencing. There are active programs who are aligned with our state's vision in order to assist people 
of all types of uh, disabilities <coughs> exercise the right and privilege, privileges and to live safely and productively in our communities. Those programs are readily available, have re readily available funds to develop bridges and obstacles that often people with disabilities encounter. We have minds that think and are creative. Those same organizations assist people with, who we serve with the proc procurement of housing that is affordable. The search of affordable housing is, is that our, in our set, our communities has become nearly at unattainable in the past decade to those people who have disabilities. Those same minds are developing creative ways to make housing affordable and safe for people who, with developmental disabilities. Um, those same programs that have hands that serve, that serve and work feverishly 24 seven at times to ensure the safety of the people they serve. In the programs with which we're currently working, we develop programs where we are responsible according to the Florida Administrative Codes Anywhere from attending a routine medical appointment to disaster planning in the event of hurricanes or any other event that may cause displacement. We support employment, we support integration, we support safety, we support people defining their own successes. We're asking partnerships through government, business, and citizens to be able to make those self-defined successes attainable for people with disabilities. My company supports Castle, supports Castle's vision and purpose. People with disabilities shall be made uh, made available safe and adequate and affordable housing. In closing, please consider Mr. Akhelouchi's words. If you think about life in community, you are bonded through a similarity of locales, shops, churches, school districts, and other community space. Yet through the diversity of your neighbors and community, you are inspired to grow, develop, and allowing each person to be welcomed and accepted, we all grow. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen Poland. I'm going to save mine for we've got all the people mind. All right. Angela Rauber? Okay, Angela, sorry. Katie Cole? No, I think you have our whole... Let's see all the applicants. ...staff together, Jeremy. <laughs> okay, you don't want to speak? Not yet, no. Okay. <laughs> Jim, uh, I can't read your writing, Jim. Is it Whitaker? Yes. So sorry. sorry. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jim Whitaker, and I live at 96675 Soap Creek Drive in Fernandina Beach. I am a special needs housing consultant, and I just kind of want to speak to that in Florida, uh, the state has been absolutely amazing in providing funding to kind of push this uh, housing uh, opportunity forward for people with developmental disabilities. Uh, there are seven such properties now in Florida scattered, and this is actually one of the smaller ones. Uh, some of them are as, as many as 100 uh, residents. So this is, just seems like a perfect location and a setting for this type of uh, residential community. So I really urge you to consider this strongly. Uh, but this is really a wonderful, wonderful thing, not only for the people with developmental disabilities, but their families. Uh, you can only imagine a family worries constantly what's going to happen to my son or daughter if I'm no longer here to care for them. So anyway, very, very important, and we would certainly love your consideration. Thank, Thank you, you for your advocacy and coming from so far to speak right. to us. Thank you. You're welcome. And now we have Barbara Braun, Braun? Yes. from Sarasota. Yes. Welcome. Hi. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Barbara Braun. My address is 2943 Main Lane, Sarasota. Um, I would like to talk to you, address a couple of um, the questions that you've asked um, in terms of what is supported services. You know, Castle will be the one that is providing the housing. They will be the landlord. And then as a couple of other people have talked about, you know, agents, individual providers that are um, licensed in uh, agreements with um, agencies for persons with disabilities, they will be doing the direct care services. So these individuals that are residing in, our, in the homes will have at minimum of three supportive staff. They will have a waiver support coordinator that will see them monthly. They will have a supported living coach that will see them weekly and the majority of them will have a personal support staff that will be seeing them daily. 
all right? In addition to that, they'll have a supported, lip, a supported employment coach if they're working in the community, <coughs> if they're in the day program, they'll have day program staff. So there will be a full circle of support around them that will be seeing them on a daily basis in some way or another, all right? So CASA will be just doing the housing, all right? Um, the question about the wait list and the need to fill it. Um, when I was talking with different providers, let me give you a little history. I was a waiver support coordinator for 16 years, and a big chunk of my clients were here in Pinellas County. And the number one issue that I had as a support coordinator was working with my coaches and finding housing. We have several houses that are, should be demolished, and that is what our individuals have been able to afford, and that's sad. Would you want your loved one with a disability living in a piece of garbage because the landlords don't care. Castle wants to build quality housing for our individuals and they maintain it. I have worked with Scott and Castle because I'm based in Sarasota. I worked with them when I first started over 17 years ago. And I will tell you without <coughs> a doubt if there was an issue with the housing, an issue with anything, it was dealt with immediately. In terms of um, safety and things like that, the waiver support coordinator, like I said, has to see them every month. The supported living coach sees them every week. We have to meet once every three months and do a walkthrough of the house. If there were any issues, they were addressed. We had to, the coach had to fill out a housing survey, run through everything, and then as a support coordinator, we had a three-page checklist right here that we had to go through to make sure that everything was okay, not just in the housing, but also the supports that they were receiving. Was there anything that was falling through the cracks? And if it was, it was addressed, all right? Question about evacuation and safety. I will tell you, our individuals on the waiver support, on the waiver support program are better ready, better prepared, excuse me, for any evacuation in any storm than anybody sitting in this room. The support coordinator and the supported living coach are required prior to hurricane season starting to complete a disaster plan. And it's not just what plan A is, it's also what's plan B and what's plan C. They are also required <coughs> to have a hurricane supply list, you know, kit ready and in the house prior to hurricane season starting. So any concerns about that, please put them aside because I'll tell you, they're okay. All right. Um, rather yeah. little quick thing. Um, any questions? Not quite. Oh. All right. I have a couple more seconds. I'm no, sorry. I think it's, cool. count. it's counting up. I'm over by 30 seconds. Oh, wow, I talk quickly. <laughs> it's going back up. <laughs> Why do you have to, why do you have to? All right. But just, again, I'm speaking in favor because there is definitely <coughs> a need for this population in this particular area. And as Jim said, our families would like to keep their individual, their adult children close to home, and this would allow it. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. I should use my phone timer to put it. Seriously. All right, next is Brian Rosscamp from Sarasota. Brian, welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Brian Rosscamp. I live at 1064 North Tamiami Trail in Sarasota. I am employed by Community Assisted and Supported Living. In addition to that, my <coughs> uh, sister lives next door to where uh, we're having the rezoning application. So um, one thing is uh, we forgot to mention that last Friday, Scott was in, Scott Elwer, our CEO, was in DC and received the Audrey Nelson Award for National Developers uh, for Development Achievement Award for their partnership with what we're doing. So oh, that's a national award given to five, five this year nationally, so it's quite an achievement that we have been able to create. Um, I have a letter from my father um, that I want to read into the record. Uh, my daughter Barbara came into our lives as an infant abandoned by her parents. We had two sons, one is me, uh, so Barbara was a beautiful addition family. We were early age that we knew Barbie had difficulty learning, but her personality charmed everyone. Schools gave uh, her the best they could, and as an adult, uh, she had a job at the filing room at Freedom Square, which is a senior housing community in Seminole that my family developed. Um, she served in that capacity till 20, for 20 years until she could no longer keep up with technology. It is then that I decided to build her a special needs home on a property I purchased on Park Boulevard, which is 12948. 
This home and ones like it are needed more and more. Special needs children become adults and eventually their parents can no longer take care of them. Barbie's home has four suites. Where every resident has their personal space plus the communal living there. Um, we know that there's a place for special needs are now the norm, so now they are not different. They don't know how to have uh, compete in their personal lives with persons that do not have visible disabilities. Uh, I picked Barbie up this weekend to bring her to our home for a visit. The love and support of the residents shared as Barbie left, Barbie uh, was sharing tears with all of them and she said goodbye. Barbie says, this is my forever home uh, and she has mutual respect for every, uh, every one of her sweet mates. A place where she can live happily, abundant life for the rest of her life. <coughs> Persons with disabilities are not afforded the same opportunities in life that the rest of us enjoy. Careers, family, home, ownership are a few. Special needs adults are for multiply, multiplying for many reasons. Most important, modern medicine is allowing them to survive longer and longer. It is the responsibility of elected and appointed officials of cities and counties to make sure that special needs persons as adults are given the opportunity to have a home in a safe community, a home like Barbie's. It would be even better if there were multiple homes in the same area that would provide an opportunity for more efficient operations and better programming of activities for the residents. And that's uh, from Robert Roskamp. Your time is up, Mr. Roskamp, but thank your family okay. for what they did at Freedom Square. It certainly still lives on. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Tallini. Tallini? Hi, Michelle. Welcome. Hi, my name is Michelle Tallini. I'm a Pinellas County resident. I also serve people with individual individuals with developmental disabilities. I also worked for the Agency for Persons with Disabilities for over seven years prior to that. Um, there is a critical need which has been stated for affordable housing in Pinellas County, um, especially those with disabilities. And, um, one of the things that really hasn't been gone over is everyone that is going to live in this <coughs> community should you approve it, is going to have assessments done. There will be over 100 assessments done annually to make sure this property is in good repair and that people are living a quality life. You're also going to be bringing 28 residents to the location that will have a small workforce for, that will actually aid the small businesses in the area. They will provide frontline entry level employment. It'll also grow the actual proceeds from the businesses in the community. Um, it's just a fantastic opportunity. If I could have my mother live there, I would. It's the concept and vision for this property is like a premier retirement community, but serving people that are significantly underserved in our community. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Davis, Dan, hey, come on up. State your name and address, please. You'll have three minutes. My name's Dan Davis. Uh, my residence is 7675 The Long Way, Seminole, Florida. And for clarification, I'm opposing the rezoning. So I don't know if there's some issues here. No, it just said on the card that you were for oh, it. I'm so sorry. I'll change it right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, my reasons for uh, opposing the rezoning at the partial location 13,000 Park Boulevard, unincorporated Pinellas County are, I purchased my property in a residential real estate zoning area for the specific purpose to build my home in a zoning area, which was used for residential purposes only. Okay, the proposal, which is referencing 2.79 acres, it, acres requesting rezoning to R, from RE to RM-CO multifamily residential commercial overlay, which would allow the development of 20 units on 2.79 acres, which is next to my single family home residence on one acre. The approval of the rezoning would conflict with current urban, suburban mix in the field that Seminole offers. I am not opposed to assisting and helping those uh, develop developmental disabilities. My daughter has Down syndrome. I am opposed to such a development in our community 
due to the number of units that will be built on 2.79 acres, which would house 28 res individuals. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here. And um, Stephen Pollan. And that's me. And you. He's the applicant. He's the rebuttal. Oh, you're part of the applicants. Okay. If you wanted to save the two minutes. You want to state your two minutes now, or do you want to? I'm going to wait. He's going to wait. Okay. Richard Wilbur. Come on up. <coughs> Hello. I'm, uh, I'm Richard Wilbur. I live at 801 Park Street North in St. Petersburg. And I'm the parent of a Down syndrome son who's mostly awake. <laughs> it's late, Dad. As we, it is. It is. As we go through this. And, I, and I'm in, uh, uh, really in support of this because I have been in charge of Richard for 54 years. Um, and when he was born, the, uh, the doctor came out and said, it's uh, a mongoloid. It's a Down syndrome child, trisomy 21. You should institutionalize the child, you and your young wife, and you should just get on with your life. Mm -hmm. We chose otherwise. I named him Richard Jr. Hey, Richard. <laughs> the doctor said that was a bad idea, that I should wait until I had a normal son. Mm -hmm. We chose otherwise. Progress has been enormous over the last half century for people like Richard. And one of the things that has happened that has made this progress possible is the opportunity for people like him to live as independently as they can. He lives independently, but as some people have already pointed out, that independence has a whole circle around him that helps him see himself as independent and helps him see himself as a successful guy. He calls it my good life that Aww. he leads. So, so Mr. Wilbur, so, why don't you ask your son, can he stand up? And Richard, can you just stand up and say hello? Hi, sleep. Richard. Thank hello. you for being here. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Same <laughs> to you. <laughs> so, nice to the more you. we can do in support of people like Richard, um, um, I'm, I'm all for it. And this housing is going to help more people be independent with those quote marks around independent, um, then I think that's a, a wonderful thing. If you'd like to read more about Richard, I wrote an essay that's on the front page of the Sunday LA Times in October about taking him to a baseball game at the Trop where it was almost a perfect game. Hmm. And <laughs> almost is what people like Richard have. They just need some help. And with a little bit of help, they can achieve great things. He's certainly achieved great things. And I'll leave it at that. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here and for bringing Richard. That was a treat. You're Thank welcome. you. Okay. And now we are going to move to the folks in opposition. And <coughs> come on up, Brian. I have, you look like you're just baiting at the breast <laughs> again. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a PowerPoint before we get started. I want to make sure that that is up it. and running. Okay, Jeez. let me just say, you only have a few minutes. I have so. ten, 10 minutes. I'm a group speaker. Okay. So if you want to identify. Uh, yeah, how about you questions. identify your group, please, because it's not on the back of the card. Did you put it on the back of the card? We spent a lot of time filling out those cards. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Mr. Gilman. You're way in the back. Okay. Who else signed time away? What's your name, sir? Oh, right here. Oh, here it now, is. Sorry. This is why we don't have it. To the rest of you. Thank uh, you. Okay, Ricky Koontz. Okay, and David Zoller. Yes. Okay, <coughs> and Emmanuel Alonso. All right. Thank you so much. Proceed. Thank you, Madam Ms. Chair. Uh, commissioners, my name is Brian Angst, uh, the law firm of McFarlane, Ferguson, McMullen. I have the honor of representing Mr. Peter Alonzo, who owns the property directly abutting the proposed development to the east. I can distill the grave concerns that the LPA and the community have in just a few words, and that's density. Density and multifamily use. As Mr. Eggers uh, pointed out, under the current zoning residential estate, they can only develop three units because <clears throat> RE limits the lot size to 32,000 square feet. What they're proposing is a 567% increase in the allowable density under the residential estate zoning standards. What they're proposing is a 285% increase 
of the, of the density under the existing land use, which is residential suburban. It's important to understand this multifamily use, no one is going to deny that there's a need in this community for affordable housing for adults suffering from disabilities. Just like there's a critical need in this community for affordable housing for teachers, affordable housing for first responders, affordable housing for law enforcement, affordable housing for disabled veterans. But what this is about and what your code and your comprehensive plan require you to consider in this hybrid legislative and quasi-judicial hearing is whether or not the density is compatible and the layout of this property is compatible with the surrounding uses. This is an established residential estate community. I'm gonna use the cursor here. I think you'll be able to see um, Mr. Alonzo's property is here. This is the proposed development. It's very narrow on Park Boulevard, but it's very deep. This is in the heart of this residential community. If you approve this, it's not a transition. It's a takeover. It's a fundamental change in the character of this neighborhood. It is completely changing <laughs> the character of all of these single family homes that have been, been developed on estate lots, most of which are over one acre. I wanna point out that the applicant's property to the south is consistent with the RE and RS. It didn't require a, a residential multifamily overlay. It didn't require a residential low land use amendment because they're operating it consistently with a single family home. And that's what we'd like to see them do here. That's what's appropriate here. That's what's compatible here. This is a map showing the residential estate uh, zoning and the residential suburban land uses, all in yellow. As Commissioner Peters pointed out or asked respectfully, I would say to increase the density on this site by 567%, going all the way down away from park uh, and into the middle of this neighborhood would be spot zoning. The office next door is residential office, uh, you know, it's a small scale office that's fronting park. It's not deep into this community. It's not dense. It's not 20 units where three units are currently allowed. This is a, a, a table that we put together that this is based on the, the land use, the residential suburban land use. So currently, if they didn't have the 32,000 square foot zoning, the si lot size uh, limitation, they'd be limited to seven units. They're asking you to rezone it to residential multifamily, which gives them two times what they would currently be allowed. Then they're asking for the density increase from the affordable housing density to 20 units, which would take them to, again, almost three times what, what they're allowed, 285% more than what they're allowed. But if you limit it to the lot size, it's really almost seven times what they're currently allowed, which is, in our view, objectively inconsistent and incompatible with the development pattern in the heart of this neighborhood. If this property was a third of the size and it was fronted up against park, that might be a different story, but it extends all the way back into the heart of this neighborhood. This is section 138-1200, <coughs> and again, this is the conditional overlay. As to address Commissioner Peters' question earlier, in my 15-year career, I have never seen a conditional overlay utilized to increase the density by 567%. I've always seen a conditional overlay used to reduce the available density from what you're asking for. If I'm asking to rezone to upzone, and I could have 82 acres in the case of the DR Horton case uh, next to the primate sanctuary uh, in Palm Harbor, which you, uh, Commissioner Flowers and Justice and Long and Peters and Eggers will remember well, we limited that from 82 units to 64 units, and that's what we use the conditional overlay for. Respectfully, the 120-foot setback, it's really a retention pond that abuts right to my client's property. There's only a 20-foot setback from my client's property to the retention pond. I'm gonna turn it over to our planning expert, Mr. Cerna, who will testify and give you competent substantial evidence as to why we believe you should uphold the LPA's recommendation of denial. Hello. Hello, uh, good evening. Luis Cerna, I'm a certified land planner with Calvin Giordano and Associates. 13535 Feather Sound Drive in Clearwater. Uh, I prepared a planning analysis of this request and uh, I've cited a, a number of concerns with the request and uh, it comes down to an issue of consistency. Uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, the uh, section 138, 120, or uh, 1200 uh, references the conditional overlay requirements. Uh, it does state uh, that the purpose of this conditional overlay requirements is to ensure compatibility. Uh, and uh, as he's indicated, and in, in my experience, typically uh, 
conditional overlays result in a decrease in density uh, below what is permitted under the requested designation. Uh, with the 50%, they're requesting a 50% <coughs> density bonus, as you know, and it'll be end up, it'll result in three times the density over the existing land use category. Uh, the purpose of the RE, dis RE district in your land development code uh, is to provide for large, low, large lot, low density residential communities. The areas covered by the RE district are generally developed with large residential estates while maintaining open space and natural landscapes. So uh, this proposed uh, multifamily development is adjacent to uh, large, uh, over uh, one acre properties that are residential estate and for, and for the purpose of, purposes of uh, open space. Um, policy 1.2.9 also uh, dealing with the affordable housing density, density bonus also mentions the importance of compatibility. And again, we are, uh, uh, our, our, my finding is that uh, multifamily adjacent to residential state district with lots this large is not compatible. Uh, as I cite, the RE district does allow farm animals. Uh, it does allow uh, as uh, agricultural activities uh, slash com uh, commercial use. And so um, it is a question of compatibility uh, in my estimation. Um, there is uh, an issue, there is such a thing as com uh, transitional zoning when it comes to uh, high density or high intensity districts uh, adjacent to lower intensity. Uh, but in this case, uh, in my opinion, multifamily development of 20 units adjacent to uh, residential estate of uh, many, many of the lots here are 1.4 acres, one acre in size. Uh, that's not a transition. That's uh, incompatible, in my opinion. Thank you, Louie. Um, in closing, <coughs> I just want to reiterate, we are not opposed to, uh, of course, critical affordable housing uses. It is the nature of the density of this proposed use and its incompatibility with the established neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This is an established neighborhood where you're allowed to have Farm animals, you're allowed to have dogs. Mr. Alonzo has up to six dogs at a time on his property. And density, abutting incompatible density, creates conflict. It doesn't just create conflict for the existing property owners, it cre creates conflict for their new neighbors. And it could be in many cases where if you approve this, you'll lose control over it because it's a conditional overlay. The site plan is conceptual. The only thing you have control over is what those conditions are, and then it moves on to the staff. And that becomes site plan and the affordable housing density bonus. All of that is a staff-driven process. So in this case, um, unfortunately, we feel like the 20 units where three is currently allowed is inconsistent, incompatible, will create unnecessary conflict that will be detrimental to both the new residents of the proposed project and also, of course, the current and the established residents uh, of, of uh, the, the community and of the neighborhood. Um, I do want to again point out that conditional overlays, I mean, one of the primary things is to decrease the number or average density of dwelling units, which is what I almost always see them do. Of course, you know, a 120 foot setback for Mr. Alonzo's property is appreciated, but it's not sufficient to address his concerns, particularly when they're going to put their stormwater 20 feet from his backyard, which he says already floods. Uh, and again, you don't have control over that. That goes to Swift Mud, it goes to the staff, and it becomes a much more difficult process for Mr. Sir, uh, to, for Mr. Alonzo to object to or to verify that things are being done correctly. So again, respectfully and um, regretfully, I have to say, we believe we provided competent substantial evidence to support the grave concerns that the LPA expressed recommending a four to one denial. One unit reduction from that LPA denial, I do not think would have changed the recommendation and we ask you to uphold it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have. Excuse me, I do have one question about whether we can have the opportunity to cross examine the expert witness who just testified at this time. They do. That, that is allowable under your quasi judicial rules. And is there a time frame on that? There is not a necessarily a set time frame. What you all have done in the past is entertain questions through the chair. Uh, we haven't seen it in a while, but this is part of a quasi judicial hearing. How about we wait till we hear from the rest of the <coughs> attorneys? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. And then come back again. Thank you. Barbara Crawl. Hello. 
Hi there. Hi. I'm Barbara Crow. I live at 7626 128th Street, Seminole, Unincorporated, 33776. <laughs> Uh, March of 2023, this year, we, ha we will have lived in our home for 34 years. Um, it's on it's on 0.99 per of an acre. Uh, like many of my neighbors, we are supportive of each other. We respect the given land use plan and have built our lives over the years based on its conditions. I oppose and change in zoning as well as a land use request. Myself and several neighbors canvass the surrounding neighborhoods uh, around the parcel during daylight hours. On November 22nd, we submitted 142 opposing signatures for both the FLU 2022-04 and 2020-05. I hear the words transition and can state we are re already a well-diversified neighborhood. We have established our homes based on the land use plan. I personally have two AL, ALF homes within less than a fourth of a mile from my house. Oak Tree Manor is two doors down from me. It houses 58 beds. Greenbrier around the corner, 12 beds. And then the independent house that Castle now purchased after it was established with four beds. Uh, it's a larger home. It's on a setting of an acre as well. It is on the long way. As well, for many years, and mostly when now Park Boulevard was near, merely uh, two lanes, 78th Avenue, out and dead ended at Oakhurst Road or 137th, there was no Park Boulevard bridge. <coughs> um, that bridge opened in 81. It already had Spoto's Stockyard Restaurant. Some of you probably have dined or had banquets there. In the late 90s, it became Winn Dixie. And people continued and still do to purchase and rebuild and re or build and remodel their homes all along Park Boulevard, all the way out to the bridge. Um, this proposed land use and change in zoning is not compatible with our neighborhood. It speaks of bold changes. This is not consistent with the density of our neighborhood. When will enough ever be enough? I'm trying to figure it out. Some of you commissioners have sat here before. You voiced in the past, we have to draw a line in the sand somewhere to stop this to continue to keep coming towards us. Someone mentioned our neighborhood has already had enough. I, along with so many neighbors, oppose these changes. Um, I'm gonna ask anybody in the room that is opposed to this rezoning to please stand right now. Thank you. Thank you. Patty Gaston. Oops. Good evening. Good evening. My name's Patty Gaston, and I live at 12785 Park Boulevard. I'm here to oppose the rezoning. Our neighborhood has been in front of this commission on an average of every two to three years. We come before you requesting the same thing every time. Please don't rezone a residential property. The applicants, they only have to win once. We have to win every time we come. The applicant uses the term transitional property numerous times in their presentation. So I researched it and here's what I found. Fundamentally stable, but in need of improvements. Land in the path of progress. Transformation and profit potential. If bought at the right price, it becomes a diamond in the rough. This property has been a residential <laughs> home since 1972. What changed to make this property transitional? The home was purchased with the assumption that a zoning change would happen. As they stated on their website, this property will be part of a new planned community. If rezoning happens, it's nothing more than encroachment of an existing residential neighborhood. As stated in the Pinellas County governing principles, successful neighborhoods are central to the quality of life in Pinellas County. Therefore, redevelopment and urban infill should not compromise the integrity and viability of existing residential neighborhoods. Shouldn't our neighborhood be allowed to keep its integrity as a residential neighborhood? The LPA voted for denial of this rezoning, and I'm asking that this board vote for denial, too. Thank you. 
Thank you. Donna Chisholm. <coughs> Good evening. Hello. Uh, hi, I'm Donna Tism, 7676 The Long Way, uh, Seminole, Florida, 33776. And I'm opposing the, the zoning. Do you put this? Seal. Oh, I see it. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the proposed uh, zoning change. I live here. Uh, my neighbors, Delane and Dan here, and then Wendy and Steve over here, who both have children that have Down syndrome. So in any way, it, it's not about that. It's about the zoning. Um, <coughs> so we came here November 9th, and it was turned down in zoning. Um, and now they've come back with a re revised with one less, uh, one less uh, unit to build on there. And at the, at, right now, th this is my house looking into that property. I mean, we bought our properties. I, I've been there, I've owned the property 22 years. And that's what I, I get to look at. We didn't, you know, <laughs> think we were going to have to have multi-units, you know, right next to us. Um, and I have seven grandkids that play in, in the back with, with the in the yard and we just uh, don't think it's conducive with the sorry I'm very nervous with the uh, surrounding properties everything's you know on an acre at least and you can see it here um, as far as can't put it that way, as far as the commercial around there um, um, I know a lot of you probably have lived here a long time um, the doctor's office has been there since 1991. The florist, which was originally the doctor's office, uh, 71, Jodo 74, it was a 7-Eleven before that. Gas station, Portobello 82. Um, I've lived here since 1974. I grew up right next to Seminole Middle School. So, you know, it's, it's not like anything spreading out and, you know, the commercial is, is creeping over. Um, so we just want to keep our neighborhood like it is, and um, hopefully it'll be able to stay that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Sam Harrison. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. My name is Sam Ierson. I live at 7600 128th Street uh, in Seminole, um, right down the road from the proposed change. Um, I am opposing uh, this change, you know, partially because, you know, when I moved, I moved to this property 10 years ago, and what I fell in love with was the, the, the large lots, you know, the wooded lots and, and the low density, okay? And so I moved from the <coughs> beach to this area for, for that. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great neighborhood, love the neighbors. I'm not, you know, I know there is a need for, for what they're trying to do, so I'm not trying to but, you know, to, to go from, you know, to do land use changes and rezoning, to do this in our neighborhood, I'm against. And I think that, you know, I think that you guys have got to, got to realize that, you know, when, when we invest in our neighborhood, like I've invested in this neighborhood, and all of our other neighbors have invested in the neighborhood, you know, that's something that, you know, when we have changes like this or we have things that come up that, you know, you guys can vote on, um, you're affecting every one of our neighbors. So, so please take that in consideration. Please take that in, consider in, in consideration of my investment, their investment, and uh, I'm opposed. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Gary Chisholm. No? You're waving in opposition, right? Okay. Kathleen Bush. In opposition. Yeah, she's waving. No. Yeah, opposition. 
Kathy Bush. All right, thank you. Cody Chisholm. Is there a Cody Chisholm? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, my name's Cody Chisholm. I, my parents own 7676 D Long Way, Seminole, Florida 33776, and that is where I currently live also. Um, so my parents bought their property in 2001 um, with the intention of being able to feel like you're living out in the country, but you're still you know, in the city at the same time because they came from a neighborhood um, in Seminole also. Um, by allowing this zoning to change and you know, making multiple buildings, it makes you feel like you're back in a neighborhood. So that is our, why we're opposing this and thank you. Thank you for being here. Genevieve Pettyjohn. Good evening. Hi, Genevieve Pettyjohn, 7955 128th Street. Um, so I am here to oppose, but I want to let you know that I did not come to this decision very lightly. I have a child when he was born, when he was three, I was told he would never go to the bathroom on his own, he would never tie his shoes, he will never be able to live out on his own. <coughs> So this was something that I really had to think about, I really had to research, I really had to make my own decision. My bottom line here, the reason I'm opposing is because I'm worried about my home and my neighborhood and the future of it. And like so many of my neighbors have already said, this does come closer and closer to our neighborhood and we want our homes and our neighborhood to stay the way it is, bottom line. My son, by the way, is at SPC, um, to be a physical therapy assistant, he is doing great. I want this home to be his home and his children's home, and I don't want these houses to keep coming at us to be rezoned over and over and over again, and we, like we have over these 14 years. I've been here multiple times now at th these rezoning meetings, so that is why I'm opposing. I want our neighborhood to stay as much of a housing neighborhood as it possibly can be. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here. Kurt Neffler, welcome. Good evening, y'all. Good, Good evening. My name's Kurt New for 7497 131st Way. Um, my main concern with this uh, proposal <coughs> is, like the attorney said, it's uh, density. Um, pretty much what he said I was going to cover. However, he didn't miss uh, one point there, is with density comes... Um, a lot of other things. I think they said it was 28 um, residents that are going to be there with some staff, which could push it to, what, 30. Um, obviously, they're going to have family members during the day who uh, visit, which could push it up to anywhere from, you know, it could be 40 people there. I don't think they addressed whether, whether the <laughs> residents are going to be able to have driver's license and have cars. Um, I, I know they said that they'll be working. Um, so, my question is the infrastructure. Where does you know thirty-five cars go along with all these buildings? Um, where does the trash go? Are they they're going to have dumpsters? Uh, you know, I don't think they really addressed all that. So the point I'm trying to make is that they're probably going to be overflowing onto the Winn Dixie lot and walking across the street to visit. Um, I'm opposed to this uh, because of this the the density of it. I think it's a good idea, and I think the need has been established for affordable housing, but I think there, in this neighborhood, it should be a, a little bit lower than 28 residents as long as they're planning. Um, that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Glenn Getchell. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Glenn Getchell. I live at 7840 128th Street North. I'm um, opposed to this. Um, we've gone through this in our neighborhood numerous times where we've had to come up here and, and fight against uh, these types of things where somebody from out of our area comes in, buys a property, knowing that they can't do something, and then they try to force <coughs> it, uh, a change. Um, basically what he has done is... Uh, bought the property, uh, 
pulled the pin on a density hand grenade and handed you the hand grenade so uh, it can blow up on all of us where we could end up with 28 uh, properties into this uh, very narrow thing that's on Park Boulevard. Everybody wants to uh, talk about, uh, you know, you have all this uh, commercial property in Park Boulevard and a busy street and all this. That's, that's not true. You have Park Boulevard, yes, it's a busy street. You go to the backyard of their pro property that they already have there and you look out and you see what Donna was talking about. You are in the country. It is an illusion. This has not changed. We have, and you know, we always talk about this conditional overlay and how it's going to protect us. We've gone to, the, if we were protected, we wouldn't be here. The conditional overlays just means that it's one step down the road. You guys accept that? Uh, then the next thing is, is that, well, we want to add another 12 buildings and now we can have, you know, well, this zoning allows for this. Uh, for two-story duplexes, we want to make that uh, two-story duplexes. So you come in, and then they go for another rezoning. So the, the conditional overlays and everything provide no protection whatsoever because if any of that uh, provided any protection to us, we wouldn't be here at all because we're already protected with the zoning that we have. And that's all we want is to stay with the zoning that we have. They want to, it, it, this, we have all these political buzzwords of uh, low income housing and disabilities and all that. We're not against any of that. They want to build three more of the houses that they have, go for it. We just don't want that to change the density. We don't want the zoning changed. We want it to stay the same type of properties that we have. It was always intended to be. So, that's it. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> well, that is it for the applicants. For <coughs> I see somebody who's not happy. So, Susan I'm sorry? Susan Tucker. Susan Tucker. Well, come on up, Susan. I'm sorry if I overlooked you. Um, I thought I had everybody <coughs> here. I'm sorry. I did fill out a card. I'm in okay. opposition. Okay, well, okay. state your case if okay. you want. All right, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Susan Tucker. I'm a homeowner at 12835 74th Avenue. My property is zoned residential estate, as are the properties of my neighbors. It's a lovely and unique neighborhood. If any of you have been there, you've noticed how unique it is. It's just down the road from um, Millennial Park. Um, and so I am opposed um, to any change in zoning that would allow for more density. Um, so I urge each of you to think about this and consider it carefully and to vote against the zoning change. Thank you. You're very welcome. Now, is there anyone else in opposition that I have missed this, this evening? Anybody? Anybody? How about those who are for it? Did I miss anybody over here? because we have finished with all of the folks that have signed in. So, Mr. Poland, do you wish to speak now? Um, and okay. And, and Madam Chair, there was a request to do cross-examination, which the parties to this proceeding are entitled to. Okay. I know that you all do not frequently see that at your hearings, but it is an entitlement to the parties to this proceeding, which would include the applicant. And then they have a balance of, in addition to that, they have a balance, balance of, of two, two and, and a half minutes. Correct. Okay. And so what are the wishes of the board? Do you want to hear the cross-examination? Yes. Sure. Okay. Well, let's go. No I, boxing gloves. <laughs> I only have one question for you. So taking a look at this, which is the land use map, the future land use map, <clears throat> Can you tell me how many residential units would be allowed on the property adjacent to 13,000 Park Boulevard to the west? To the west? Uh, no. The, gov the general office? No, I don't. Okay. No, I can't. You don't know? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And are you aware that it would allow residential units to be built on that ROG land use category? Uh, no because you did not take that into consideration as part of your analysis, correct? 
Uh, no, I took, in, I took into consideration the existing use on the property uh, and it's generally office uh, and that, that's existing there. Do you know how much that land, what, how many units per acre are allowed in the ROG? Uh, no, no not, not off the top of my head. Before you take that down, from my poor old eyes, could you just outline which piece you're talking about? Purple. We're talking purple. about the purple area? Okay, got it. I wanted to just clarify and make sure <coughs> I, we were all looking at the same thing. Okay, thank you. All right, do you know the answer? Yes, I do. How about you share it? I'll share it. It is, it, it allows 15 dwelling units per acre on that site, on that, in that category. That's going to depend on the size and the acreage, and that analysis hasn't been done, but it does allow 15 residential dwelling units per acre. Okay. Anybody else? Brian? No? Okay, and they have two minutes and 36 seconds. Two minutes and 36 cents and 36 seconds left, if you so wish. Give us a minute to get the clock. Someone. Someone. <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. My name is Stephen Poland. I'm an attorney. Uh, I've been counsel to Renaissance Manor and Castle and Scott Eller for. Oh, the clock hasn't started. Yeah, well, she's still working on it, so just give us a second. Okay, you ready? Anytime you are. Okay, right, the clock's ticking. Okay, we're good. Go okay, ahead. I'll repeat myself real quick. My name is Stephen Poland. I'm an attorney. I've been counsel to Renaissance Manor, Castle, and Scott Eller, uh, maybe almost for 20 years, uh, dealing with uh, uh, his uh, uh, housing projects and providing housing for people with disabilities. I specialize in the Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act uh, and group home living situations. Uh, so the elephant in the room here is uh, the Fair Housing Act and people with disabilities. Under normal circumstances, <coughs> Uh, no one gets to pick their neighbors. And it seems that the only time uh, the issue of, of, of who can be a neighbor arises is when it, there is a group uh, living situation for people with disabilities. Uh, I've gone through many of the county documents. The county has, uh, has complied with HUD regulations in doing an analysis of impediments to fair housing. Uh, it emphasizes that uh, uh, people with disabilities make up the largest number of complaints about housing discrimination in the county. Uh, it also lays out that zoning can be and is an impediment to housing. Now, in the overall scheme of things, uh, what we've heard here is uh, it's not compatible with the neighborhood. Uh, the dogs are going to get upset. Uh, investment is going to be uh, uh, messed with because people with disabilities are going to be afforded an opportunity or attempted to afford an opportunity to live in their neighborhood. There are some, some a lot of this has, has to do with uh, code words of discrimination. I'm not saying anybody is discriminatory, I'm gonna, but the, co the commission needs to take all this in consideration. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry I had to push him out of the way because we've got not very much time and we've got a lot of ground to cover. Basically, your comprehensive plan encourages affordable housing and independent living. It also encourages um, density and bonus incentives and that is what we're trying to achieve. When we talk about transition, the transition that's occurring in this area of Park Boulevard is 24 units, 15 units, to, to five units to two and a half units. And I'm out of time, but we hope that you, we request that you approve our land use application and our rezoning request. We're available for additional questions if you have them. Thank you. All right, board, uh, we're now in the commissioner. I have a, a question for uh, the gentleman, I believe his name is Mr. Poland. And I may have misunder or misheard something that you said or misunderstood something that you said. Did you mention that uh, people with disabilities make up the uh, bulk of complaints when that, it comes to housing discrimination? That's what that's according to the analysis of impediments that was uh, 
uh, prepared by county staff, um, I think in 2017. I didn't say the bulk, it was the, it was the majority. Oh, the majority? Yes. And that was in Pinellas County? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Anything else, Commissioner? No, ma'am. Commissioner Peters? Yeah, I had a question for staff. And staff, I was wondering if you could <coughs> tell me why, what were the very specific reasons why it was, de it was denied at the LPA? <clears throat> As I recall, the LPA did not state specific reasons. Um, it could be the same issues came up at that hearing regarding compatibility and things like that, but they did not specifically say why. They didn't? They didn't say why one was a four to one vote and the other was a three to two vote. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Members? Commissioner <coughs> Scott? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and this is probably a question for staff, but just looking through the letters that we received, emails in opposition, there was one uh, very unflattering letter about poor maintenance at the existing facility. So I'm just wondering if there's been any code violations or any enforcement action that I don't know if anybody would know the answer to that question off the top of their head. But, I don't know. Yeah. No? Okay. Know what? No, it's a code enforcement question. Now I don't know. That's a okay. different department. Okay. Well, if I might just offer, I'm up and down that road <coughs> four or five times a week, and I'm very familiar with the surrounding neighborhood, and I'd be very interested in what that issue is with code enforcement because it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I know the facilities that we're talking about because we've <coughs> had them here before us in the past, and I always pay attention just because we had such a crowded room when we came to their expansion uh, several years ago. Some of you may remember it. Oh, yeah. um, right. So I do have another one for staff. Yes, Commissioner Peters. So um, <clears throat> just so I'm not making an assumption and I'm not right, I know it's very common in North County that we have one house per two acres, one house per one acre, but in South County, we don't ha do we have a lot of or compared to North County, because I don't know of too many areas in South County where we have preserved that uh, one house per one acre or one house per two acres. Um, most of South County is very, very dense uh, <clears throat> comparatively to North County. And so I'm just curious if my assumption is correct, if you can help me out with that. Yeah, the largest uh, rural-like area is in Northeast Pinellas County in the East Lake area. There are <coughs> scattered pockets of similar places, but this is not as large in the South County. This is one of them. There's others near Pinellas Park. We have the horse farms, things like that. There's yeah, a that's few about in one, one street. Yeah, okay. There's so there's very little in South County <clears throat> that allows for this kind of estate housing. Okay. It, yes. Is it comments or just Scott? question? Just questions? Well, like, he answered my, my oh, assumption. No. I'm, I'm sorry, I was asking the chair if it if she just wanted questions now or just comments in questions general. Comments, comments whatever you yeah. yeah commissioner scott did you have more yes thank you madam chair um so if i'm understanding this right so if we granted the request it would allow a maximum of 20 residential dwelling units but what we saw which we realize is not binding <coughs> just proposed 10. so what would prevent this from becoming each, 20? Each one of those buildings was a duplex, so that each one would allow two units. So they are, okay. Right. Okay, got it. All right. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one gentleman was asking a question about um, automobile parking, trash collection, and things of that nature. On the drawing that was presented to us, I believe the number of spaces for parking was 32. Typically, it's one and a half space per unit. Um, for the gentleman that was asking, usually it's one and a half spaces, parking spaces per unit. And when persons, depending on the level or severity of their disability, that determines whether or not they'll have a license to drive. So that would kind of be hard to come up with that number if you don't yet know who your <coughs> clients are. So I just wanted to answer that gentleman's question. And also they would be required to have um, a um, area for um, disposal of waste and things of that nature so there would be proper garbage cans and all of that for them um i just wanted to share a, a couple of uh, 
a couple of comments just from the overall conversations. I was trying to keep track of the variety of concerns that have been addressed here, but I also read the letters in opposition. I will say, though, that the majority of the letters, not all, but the majority of the letters in opposition all say that there's concern with homelessness or the struggle with strong mental illness providing services to that population, trauma, disabilities, or co-occurring <laughs> disorders. Not very much of it is focused on density. <clears throat> However, um, this is an issue that we will continue to have in Pinellas County, and I think in many counties, because there's no more land left. So any projects that are being done, whether they are for persons with disability, whether uh, it's persons with low income, um, whether it's attainable housing, which is the new buzzword, instead of affordable or market rate uh, housing, density is going to be the topic because that's the only way you'll be able to provide the number of units that are being requested. Um, and I know that I have sat here and I have supported an increase in density in order to be able to provide units for persons to live because this is what they come up with in neighborhoods. Um, we saw it happen a lot, um, even though it wasn't our purview, but we saw it happen in St. Petersburg where they were just trying to provide some units for uh, senior living um, on a property where a church wanted to sell their property and persons didn't want to see um, individuals move into their community in an apartment-like setting. Um, they wanted to keep it uh, single-family homes. And that's just going to be more and more difficult to do. Um, if persons are going to live here and we're going to make those spaces available, density is going to be the way that it has to be done. I'm not saying that um, this would not be an encroachment on your community or um, something that you are accustomed to living <clears throat> in your area. <clears throat> um, I've had apartments come up to be developed around where I purchased my single family home. Um, but this is going to be an issue that comes about continuously because we just don't have any other way to make available um, housing opportunities for persons no matter uh, if they are disabled, if they're working, if they're uh, market rate, we're, we're going to have to address the issues surrounding density. <clears throat> I was concerned about the safety issues, the health and safety issues, which is why I asked the questions that I asked um, of the owner of the castle properties and why I asked if you had been, um, if you had been under any type of uh, correction plan um, with ACA or any other organization that licenses you or provides you the funding by which to do this. Because when there are concerns or complaints, um, not just in viewing the property, but in the health and safety of persons. It goes through that process, and they determine whether or not it was founded or unfounded, and, of course, will put you on a corrective action plan if it was, and then that increases the number of times they come out and review your um, facility. Um, I worked at Gulf Coast, and we had a supportive housing program, and they place individuals in facilities like yours, um, we have 86 programs in 37 counties, and um, I believe some of our residents may have been in one of your properties in Sarasota because that's where they are. So it's 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 difficult because we want to <clears throat> we want I want to preserve the integrity of the communities that we have, but I also know that at some point um, it's going to happen. So whether or not it's approved today or not approved today, I'm glad Commissioner <clears throat> Peters asked the question about the reasons for denial because I was looking for that to see if it was something that I was missing um, that may not have been provided at the time. Um, but I, I, I couldn't find any reason why other than, um, you know, just hearing the testimony um, and the comments from the residents in the community. So this is, is that it? it? Yes, ma'am. Uh, anybody else have any questions, concerns, thoughts? Just a couple Commissioner Eggers. <clears throat> yeah. I think, I think um, you know, when I think of situations like this, I try to think of, um, you know, a, 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 an incredible <clears throat> need in the community and what the, uh, what the folks are trying to bring forward. And I also think of the communities that you all have and where you live. And immediately started to think of you know how do we how do we compromise here because we have 
uh, property that is clearly facing Park Boulevard that um, <coughs> has it has a I mean, it's not unreasonable to assume that you could ask for, maybe get that kind of zoning that they're asking for in the front half of that property. So to me, there's, there's, there is spot zoning considerations. There's also intrusion into the neighborhood considerations. These are long, thin properties that dive deep into the neighborhood where you all live. So my thinking is more along the lines of, you know, getting the zoning that they want on the front half of the property and doing the building on the front half of the property um, so that you're not affecting the homes to the south, you're not affecting the home to the west, to the east. Excuse me. Uh, there's one home to the east, I think. Um, and so you're 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 trying to provide the service that's needed in a more moderate, less dense manner. And I, you know, and I don't know how we get there. I'm not, you know, the person that figures that out. But I th I think there's a there's a solution there that allows for that. Um, as, as was pointed out, we mean the, the, the node around that intersection of commercial, you know, you, you don't have to let it keep growing. It can stay just the way it is right now. So we, we, we're, we're, just, we're just saying from an arbitrary standpoint, as it sits on Park Boulevard, maybe that's something to consider. The numbers obviously are not 20 units. It's less units than that. Um, and I think it would be a reasonable compromise as, as long as there are substantial setbacks and there are substantial screening provided so just just some thoughts so as a compromise commissioner mm -hmm. eggers do you have something commissioner peters i will when you're done Commissioner my final thoughts no? uh, as a thought if the applicant can come forward please mr oh yeah uh, i'd like to know because i am so familiar with that area and it is so heavily trafficked on park boulevard right yes. there and we have had uh, other another facility that came and folks were very worried about people wandering about and having accidents trying to cross that road. What kind of a buffer did you talk about that might be able to be provided, like the podocarpus or whatever that thing is that grows so high, or well, there's to be able to sh shelter yeah. the folks that are so concerned about the intrusion on their neighborhood? Seems to me that with plant life, you could almost conceal what you're doing. Correct. So could you speak to that a little bit? Because sure. at the same time, it would cut down on noise, it would cut down on a lot of these issues, it would seem to me. Yes. So there's two typical landscape buffers that we enjoy using, and one is a podocarpus hedge. They grow thick, they grow dense, and you can grow them about 12 feet tall and still maintain them comfortably. The challenge with podocarpus is they don't grow as fast, for example, as an areca palm. Areca palms within a year can be, you know, in excess of 12 feet and you plant them densely together and they act as a landscape buffer and good privacy as well. So between that and the six foot, uh, and I'm, I was planning on putting up like a vinyl fence. Uh, so therefore, there would, be, there would not be any visibility through the fence. It would be complete but privacy. But then you'd cover that with the palms in the front so nobody would necessarily you would have the, know the fence was there? You would have the, the, the PVC fence facing the neighbors, and then we would have the um, podocarpus hedges on our, on the podocarpus or the areca palms in our cycles, we have to maintain them. So above the fence, what they would see is the, either the vegetation of the podocarpus or the areca palm. As a thought, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I, so, so, you know, this one is a, <clears throat> I understand that APD has this long waiting list. I understand that. I understand that APD is way underfunded. Um, I personally have hired numerous people that have disabilities. When I was in the legislature, I had a girl that had cerebral palsy and was in a wheelchair. Um, <clears throat> on my campaigns, I, I, ordered, I, I uh, hired some, <clears throat> you know, a gentleman with another disability. So I'm very familiar with it, and I understand the need. And in the legislature, I had a, you know, I got a study done to help <clears throat> um, people with disabilities to have better independence because their threshold of income was so limited that we could raise that threshold. So I'm very familiar with the need <clears throat> and kind of the crisis that the folks that you are working with are, are in. And, uh, and I <coughs> believe that Pinellas County needs more of that. <clears throat> so this is difficult for me because I also believe in South County that we have to do some preservation. And we have enormous green space and open space and zoning in North County that is one acre per household, one house per two acres. But down in South County, we have a very limited amount of that. And so I understand why they want to preserve their neighborhood. 
<clears throat> to keep it like that, <clears throat> and I, I do, I truly understand it. And I'm not looking for South County to be a complete concrete county. Um, <clears throat> and so I know there's a few spotted areas where one section on Park Street has some one acre lots. You know, there's a few random ones, but I, have, I do have concern about that. I know the need, I really do know the need, but when it comes down to the density and the consistency and stuff like that, <clears throat> I, I think I'm gonna be on the side of the neighborhood. Um, I understand what you're doing. It is, it's so needed. Um, I just don't know if I'm okay with a limit, you know, losing that preservation for, for that particular neighborhood. <clears throat> um, we, we have, you know, there's, there's room for commercial development on, I mean, we're watching the density increase in South County exponentially between First Avenue, Second Avenue, Central Avenue, everywhere all over South County, it is, the density is just growing immensely. So um, I think in particularly in South County, we have to do a little more preservation. <coughs> so, you know, that's, that's where I stand on that point. Can I, can I give you Madam some thoughts? No. <coughs> yeah. Perhaps what? respond to Mr. Eggers is what I was going sure. to offer in his request to compromise. It's go ahead, Katie. If, if it would be. Yes, go ahead. If you would be willing to entertain that. Thirty second pause. We're going to take a break here in a few minutes before we vote. Just, just cause. Sorry, I didn't. I can't see behind sorry, him, so I didn't realize. He's trying to change his tape. All right, thirty seconds pause. <laughs> Mr. Eggerson, if we would consider amending our... Yeah, so, so, okay. he needs a pause. Right, that's so that's what I was responding to. Switching batteries. Oh, switching batteries. Well, then, you want to... How about we take a two-minute break and we'll come back? Okay. Is that all right with everybody before we have to go? Yes, we can come off this. 200 feet. Is that all right with you? <laughs> Two minutes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can do that. That's what I was going to suggest. Mm -hmm.
Let's reconvene our meeting, please. I do believe we in our, are in a posture now. Commissioners, any more questions or comments that you need to make? Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think we've all heard that, you know, it is a difficult decision when you talk about changing uh, the face of an area. Um, I know we dealt with the other facility uh, nearby on DeLong, the assisted living facility, and that came back several times over the years. Um, and I, I think we finally got to a place where the density was increased on the site without expanding the borders. But I opposed the expansion down the site uh, when it came, I think, in 2014 or 15. Um, I do see this site a little differently, and, um, and I do see the need dramatically, and I do see the opportunity to provide a safe haven for <coughs> folks um, in a very safe area. Um, it's not in a commercial specific type zone. Um, and I do think it is, as the attorney pointed out, I do think it is a, um, a real transition from the office in general and retail into the A&E. So um, if that's the will of the board, that's, that's where I will be supporting. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, no more, no more comments, no can more we, questions. Can we hear what they're... Yeah, the compromise. <laughs> ask <them. laughs> the point that I brought up about... Compromise. The half the top. There's two pieces I'm looking at. The, 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 this piece split in two, so the, the top half being rezoned and getting the two, two um, you know, different treatment versus the back half getting the, um, the original treatment, so that the total number of units on there would be limited and where it would be located would, could be either a, a straight line or a step line so that the additional houses are against the commercial side. Um, <coughs> it, it, just to provide that, that the density that they need but not the density that they're asking for. So I, I just and some I thoughts. Would, and I would offer to the board yeah. the land use as proposed and the zoning as proposed <coughs> is what is before you tonight. You could hear about alternate plans, but they may not be plans that could be approved yeah. here and this evening. I am just bringing it up so that they can absorb it so they'll know how I'm leaning on my vote. Um, yes. If you would, Madam Chair, um, the applicant, it would, Katie Cole with Hill Ward Henderson representing the applicant. The applicant, um, while we, we appreciate uh, Commissioner Egger's thought, and, and looking here, as you can see, the parcel is the same depth as, as the other parcels. However, the conditional overlay was intended to provide the significant rear setback. Um, the adjacent parcel that Castle owns here has this has its parcel line here, and the applicant would be willing to have you all, which I believe you could amend a condition on the conditional overlay as opposed to changing legal descriptions and such, um, would be willing uh, and agreeable to amend the condition on the conditional overlay to provide a 274 foot rear setback which is that line so it is the depth of a long park of the existing castle facility <coughs> and the rog is the full depth and this conditional overlay would have a building setback of 274 so any buildings would be on the front it would not address the commissioner's concern about the number of units. It would still be for the entirety, five units per acre of 2.79 acres. And then if and when the site plan that's presented for staff review in conjunction with the affordable housing application was approved for the full bonus, it could potentially, it would still be capped at the 20 <coughs> units. I'm looking at and the site Ms. White to be sure I say that correctly. And, and I do agree with Ms. Cole that the conditions could be modified, not the overall zoning category or the land use category, but your conditional overlay does allow for basically the conditions that you've seen there um, and many of the conditions that are intended to try to make uses fit and, and what it allows for are certain things here, including setbacks. And the site plan comes back here, right? No, no it does not. No? It is reviewed by staff at a staff <laughs> level. Often argued site plan, I keep being told, we don't do that at the county commission. So um, so just for clarification, um, 
so there would be no building on the bottom, uh, the, the southern half of the property, except the piece of the house, that, the existing house that might. The southern about a little. 200 and. 274 feet. And where does that, how does that line up with the, uh, the property? So Could you just move it up a little bit? Yeah. Sure. The property to the east. <coughs> have a home there. I'm just trying to make sure. Well, I think, so this is the subject property. Mm -hmm. This is the property to the right. east. Here is the property okay. line, and this is already owned by Castle. Right. So it would line up right there. Okay. So no, no building on this on the southern half of that property. It would be a building section. So if you're still talking the number of units that you're talking about, then you're then you're introducing multi-story. No, you could perhaps do that with triplexes. The conditional okay. overlay okay. allows duplexes okay. and triplexes. So we're, not, we're so not changing that part of the. No, sir. Okay. All right. <coughs> yes. No. So I've got my. You know, okay. If, if Everybody we can, over here. Okay. We can do. I mean, for me, that's important. All right. Um, so the the. And what you would be taking wanna, a vote on you, first is the land use correct. application. Stop. If you were to entertain, if that was to pass, and you move on to the zoning, vote. That could be where you might entertain the change to the condition that was just discussed. And, All right. As that, to the land use. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just have one more comment. We did ask. I did ask for specific <coughs> feedback. And the, 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 the attorney for the applicant, would, I'm sure, has a comment to make about that. I think we should give him the latitude to make comment about that. But I, the, the, my opponent. Opponent. the opponent. The opponent. I mean, the opponent. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I'll be very brief. Um, well, that certainly seems like it's intended to benefit my client, specifically Mr. Alonzo. I don't know that you all have or that anyone in this room has sufficient information about how that reconfiguration would affect everybody else. And I want to point out, this is the subject parcel, and then this is an adjacent parcel here, but it goes to this, this point, and then there's another parcel here. Uh, and there's people here and here that are also here in opposition. Um, if the density is going to be um, significantly <coughs> redistributed, um, I don't want to have to do this all over again, but I don't think we have enough information to have an informed decision on what impact a 274-foot setback to benefit Mr. Alonzo would have. And Mr. Alonzo has authorized me to, to represent that to you. Um, he's not here just looking out for himself. Um, and all of the concerns I expressed, he continues to have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. <coughs> now, what are the wishes of the board? Yeah. Everybody's had their time. I just want to uh, comment. As presented, I'm going to have a tough time supporting this. I, I just don't think that they've done enough to really address the concerns of, of the community there. Understanding the, the tremendous need that, that there is for this project, I think that there is, as Commissioner Eggers pointed out, I think that there is another way around it. Um, but I'm just going to have a tough time supporting what we have in front of us right now. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. So that we get to a point where we make a decision and also go home at some point tonight. Uh, I'm going to move approval of item number 32. The land use portion? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All those in favor? Wait, 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 we don't have a second. The, and, the, and the discussion that, that I've talked about and the compromise, that would be addressed in the zoning piece. Correct. <clears throat> Your discretion. Do we have a second? Okay, this goes no second. Okay, there's no second. Madam Chair, I have a question. If yes. I may. So, to the applicant, <clears throat> you can build seven units without any additional density bonus or any additions. Is it that the seven units just don't make the financial sense needed to make for the construction on this site, or he just wanted that additional density to be able to service additional clients? Question number one. Question number two, would he move forward with the seven units that he can do anyway without land use or without a request for increased density? Um, I can let Mr. Eller answer Thank that you. because it, it has a nuance dealing with state funding, too. Okay. And that, it, that is where the challenge is. You, you know, if, if Florida Housing were to fund what I built next door, we would not be having this discussion. But the problem is, is they, they will not fund it. They want the one-bedroom units, so that's where, you know, my hands are tied. If I came back and said, well, I'm going to change this whole thing, I'm just going to do people here with co-occurring disorders, and I'm going to build three 6,000-square-foot houses and put eight people per house, 
you know, that would be a different story, but that's not what I'm wanting to do here. Our intention is to make a community within a community for people with developmental disabilities and to make the numbers work, because when you go through credit underwriting, you have to show that it's going to have uh, c positive cash flow, and we're already uh, very close to that point now, so we have to make sure that it cash flows, and that's why we're trying to get the numbers to where we can. That's why I asked the question. Thank you very much. You. Could, could I ask staff, <coughs> please? One, <coughs> staff, one question. Staff. Yeah, I mean, there was a comment made that we don't have enough information. Mm -hmm. So my question is, you've heard the conversation about splitting, you know, the 274 feet. So the, 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 the construction would be done on the, on, the, on the northern half, so to speak, property. Mm -hmm. how, 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 how are they going to, if they keep it single store, how are they going to get 20 units there? The, the question is, we don't know how it's going to affect. It's going to reduce the square footage. The conditional overlay allows duplexes Ooh. and triplexes. The, condi uh, <coughs> the, con excuse me, the concept plan you saw had all duplexes. Some of those could turn into triplexes, so you'd have three unit buildings. Okay. And they have to be at least 10 feet apart. You have to have room for your driveway coming in. The parking and stuff like that could still go back there. Just the structures couldn't be built. Um, so the pond and, and the parking and stuff could still go. In that behind the 274, the, southern part. the structures could not be <coughs> there. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it would fit. I'd have to. We'd have to examine yeah, I, I that. Understand. I understand. Thank you. Did you make a ruling that it died for lack of a second? It last died for lack okay. of second. So now we were at. <coughs> well, that is it. the wish of the board. That is it. That was the wish of the board. So the zoning is mute, correct? The zoning item agreement. But the only other alternative I would offer to you all is if there is a will. You, your code says that no identical application or, or an application can be heard for another six months on the same parcel. If you wish to give them an opportunity to bring something else back to you, you could move to deny without prejudice to reapply. Do we want to move to deny without prejudice, board? Otherwise, they're prohibited from coming back and reapplying for six months. I would like to make that motion only because um, <clears throat> Senator Eggers did present an alternative that could potentially work if they look at the square footage per unit, which is how they'd be able to place those units on the property, even having two bedroom units. So um, I would like to make that motion that we <coughs> provide them with the opportunity to come back um, sooner. in six months. Sooner rather than later, right? I'll say sooner rather than later. So I got a comment about that. Can <coughs> I get a second for purposes of discussion? For, okay. <coughs> okay, now we're in discussion. Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so the um, first committee denied it, four to one. And, uh, and what they came back with was reducing one and they expanded the, the setback on the back end. <clears throat> and yet the entire community has come, that neighborhood has come, and so they don't support it. So what I would really rather see them do is really work with these neighbors and come up with a compromise and a solution. And I don't know if you could do that quicker than six months. Maybe you can, but I would like them to work with the community and come up with a resolution. And this has happened before where they went back and they worked with the neighborhood and, and everybody ended up being happy. And so, you know, that's what I would rather see is that they work with the neighborhood <coughs> and really come up with a solution because everybody's in agreement that we love what they're doing and we need it. I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't agree with that. Um, and we love what they're doing and we need it. So that's clear. But I would like to see them work with the neighborhood and come up with a real solution, not just eliminating one unit. This motion doesn't, it doesn't address it's permissive. It. They can yeah, work, they can, it yeah. gives them all the time and in the world I, to work I with the neighbor. I will gladly accept, accept that friendly yeah. amendment, yeah. So, we, yeah. so we have a motion and a friendly <laughs> amendment. Do we want to open the board and take a vote? Oh God, I put my thing away. <clears throat> do we have a second? Oh yeah, we do have a second. Yes, yeah, there is a second. <coughs> okay. With the friendly amendment. With the friendly amendment. I'm a yes. For some reason it's not coming up. Okay. It's not coming up on the screen. Yeah, the screen's not up either. The screen's not up either. <laughs> Do we need a verbal word? Yikes. Yikes. I guess it's taking its time. <coughs> <coughs> 
Please. Have you fixed it? I mean, it's not showing up there, and it's not showing on some of the voice vote. Do. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's unanimous. It's unanimous in favor. Okay, it's oh. unanimous. Oh, it was showing up on your screen. I okay. Gotcha. Okay, then that passes unanimously. Are we good? So somebody want to make sure that, do a brief explanation what we just did so if people are confused. Uh, what you, not, but, you, the, this was two cases, companion cases. Item number 32 was a request for a change in land use. Item number 33 was a request <coughs> for a change in zoning. You denied without prejudice to reapply, which means... There is not a six-month prohibition, so you denied without prejudice to reapply within that six-month time period on the land use case. Since the land use case failed, there is no need to take action on item number three, the zoning case. Okay. Everybody clear? Bye, Brian. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, now. You want to give them a minute to clear. <coughs> 32A and 33. We're on 34 now. Correct. <coughs> you said you might want to give him a minute to. I heard what you said. I haven't said a word. I'm just sitting I didn't, here. Cool. You didn't acknowledge <laughs> what I said. <laughs> like two keys down. I've got yeah. you talking over here, over here. <coughs> they like at least she's not stepping at you and I. Not a problem, so Madam Chair. Oh, wait a second. I need to. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, no, let me in. I didn't want to hear from the volume. I did not say that. That's what I heard. He's got me from basketball. Usually, Speedy's. <laughs> snapping at somebody down at this end, so it's nice to see it change. For if you could move your conversations out outside, please. Chris says Speedy is usually snapping at them. He's I had him come, come stay at my house to make sure <laughs> Speedy I was doing, you know, songs. For Go home, but you can't yeah. stay here. I set up him a little office now, now too. He could do his homework while I did mine. There you go. So he just decides to be speaking on the next day. Hey, folks. So I have his parents taking the best care. Thank you. He's coming. Hey, Lou. I'm having trouble joining now after we got kicked out of the because I think we have uh, another yeah we're on 34 now so um, excuse me sorry Barry you want to introduce 34 or Madam Chair thank you Madam Chair um, agenda item number 34 is a proposed resolution to supplement the fiscal year 2023 operating and capital budget for unanticipated fund balances in the General Emergency Service Star Center, Emergency Communication 911 System, Fire Districts, Surface Water Utility, Capital Projects, Airport Revenue and Operating, Solid Waste Renewal and Replacement, Water Revenue and Operating, Water Renewal and Replacement, oh, Sewer Revenue and Operating, and Sewer Renewal and Replacement Funds. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. Thank you. And do we have any public comments on this one? No? Move and approval. Second. <laughs> All right. And approved by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Eggers. Please open the board and allow us to vote. Commissioner Lapval is a yes. I'm a yes. Oh, here we go. Now it's no, it's not up on my computer. Oh, there we go. All right. Okay, I'm a yes. All right, 30, 34. Okay, 35. Agenda item number 35 is a legislative petition of Pinellas County to vacate a portion of a right of way known as Old Roosevelt Boulevard, lying approximately 800 feet more or less northwest of the intersection of Old Roosevelt Boulevard and 35th Street North. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publica <coughs> publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection have been received by staff. All interested parties have been notified as to the day of the public hearing and no correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before Sorry. the board to no, be heard. My fault. Okay, thank you. Move approval. We have a motion by Commissioner Justice and a second by Commissioner Flowers. Please open the board and allow us to vote. Yeah, no, it's not. I'm a uh, yes. On I'm that a one. yes. I'm a yes. It didn't pop up this time. I'm sorry. Okay, so that passes unanimously. And now we are on item 36. Agenda item number 36 is a petition of Team Savage Incorporated to vacate 12 foot wide drainage easement lying along the south boundary of Lot 1 Block U, Curlew City. Since this is a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. 
For those wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Signify by saying, I do. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection have been received by staff. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing. No correspondence be has been received <coughs> and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. And we have no public comment, right? Wait. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded by Commissioner Justice and seconded by Commissioner Eggers. Please bring up the voting card. It does what I want to do, honey. We have one more thing. See, I'm a yes. I was coming up earlier. Oh. I'm a yes down there. I'm a yes. And that passes unanimously. So we don't have anything else on our agenda, but we do have the resolution from the uh, lighting of the Skyway. Does everybody want to move that forward or bring it back? If it were, what is your pleasure? Move approval. Second. And that's for approving all of the ones that we've already approved. Oh, we're on approved. the list. The resolution the yeah. that was yeah. sent out. Yes. <coughs> yes, ma'am. So, yeah, that's fine. I'm a yes. Okay, we're all yeses. It passes <laughs> unanimously. <laughs> and with, all, with your permission, the, we are adjourned.